pastor in Oregon, uh, pastor some very precious people in Oregon, and um, still doing apologetics, still trying to um, uh, go further in my classes and courses um, on original languages, exegesis, et cetera, et cetera. I'm currently in second year Greek and uh, just finished up first year Hebrew and then now taking a class in uh, Hebrew exegesis, took one in New Testament exegesis, took one in textual criticism. So I've been pretty busy, but it's a passion that I have. So um, I think that's about it. Uh, oh, I have a blog, apostolicacademics.com, where I deal with a lot of the stuff um, with original languages, post diagrams, etc. So if you're interested in that, apostolicacademics.com. Um, I also want to say before I start, I have enjoyed my interaction with uh, Veda, Mr. Hedgeman. He's been uh, nothing but a gentleman to me, and uh, I hope that I can do the same thing regarding him. And looking forward to interacting with Mr. Shamoon. So let's roll. You ready? Yeah. So let's go into what is oneness and why do you believe it's true? Okay. Um, so the, de uh, the definition from my perspective of, of oneness theology is and, and a lot of this you've already heard from me, but the the old we always start with the Old Testament. I'm more a Trinitarian do the same thing, but we start with the Old Testament in that it is our tutor, as Galatians would say, to lead us to Christ. So the Old Testament was the epistemologic framework of the New Testament writers. They would propound a doctrine and then they would say, for it is written, uh, appealing back to the Old Testament uh, scriptures. Um, so if we start, for example, with Genesis 1, 1, the, the second Hebrew word in the entire Bible is barach. It is, uh, create. Now, so English would be in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And interestingly, that Hebrew verb is actually a masculine singular person, third person, uh, uh conjugation. So right at the very beginning, the second word in, in the word of God, the Hebrew text and as well the Septuagint, by the way, uh, indicates that we have one creator. We have one person created. It's not just enough to say one creator. Uh, Trinitarians will tell us all day long. We believe in one God. So it, it's further than that. It goes further than that. Um, and then, of course, we could go to the Shema. Um, and I know that you guys are well familiar with that. I would assume that the audience is as well. Um, so just English is hero, Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. But here's the catch. You have, after the Shema and explaining the, the Shema, you have single person pronouns applied to what Moses just said. This is the identity of Yahweh. And he uses single person pronouns. Um, one of the things that's missing, in my opinion, and I got to hurry, but one of the things that's missing in Trinitarian presentations is that from the Old Testament, they will quote, you know, the Shema, the usually Isaiah 40 through 45, etc. But they don't they don't include the single person pronouns. And that that to me is is really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, so I could go as well. Isaiah 40, 45. Single person pronouns. Oh, by the way, Septuagint uses the masculine singular haste for the adjective of one. And um, we could look at Isaiah 43 and 10, uh, all the different scriptures. See, I, Isaiah 43, 10, I don't have it copied down, but I think it says beside me, I even I am the Lord and beside me there is no savior. And again, you have single person pronouns. From our perspective, what we would say is, is Yahweh being honest here? Did, did he for 4,000 years of Hebrew history, approximately, uh, tell his people over and over using single person pronouns, I'm one and you don't worship any more than me. I'm one. I created all by myself, all alone. Again, single person pronouns. Um, and, and then in the New Testament, all of a sudden that switches. And now we've got two other persons that wasn't known in the Old Testament. Now, I'm well familiar with Alan Siegel's, um, what is it, Two Powers of Heaven. I've got it. In fact, I've also got scathing rebukes of it uh, in exegetical format as well. Um, if the listeners are copying or taking notes, I would ask them to look very closely at Isaiah 45, 21. It, uh, Isaiah 45, 21. So 
what you have here, let me get to the thing. So English, tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? From then, let's see. Who has told it? Have not I, Yahweh? And note this. And there, oh, is that my time? Yeah, you can finish your thought, though. You can finish your thought. Okay. Okay, so uh, what did he say? He said, who has told it? Who has told it? Have not I, Yahweh? And there is no other God beside me. And that, and then he goes, say, goes on to say, a, a just God and Savior. Interestingly, whenever he says it, one term is, is God, is Elohim. And then the other term is uh, when he says there's no one beside me, single person pronoun, and it's L. There is no plurality in L. So you have L, single person pronoun, saying there is no plurality beside me. Um, I've got tons of more stuff, but that's All right. it. All right. So thank you for that, uh, Roger. Thank you for that. So at this point, Sam, I'm going to unmute you. So if you can introduce yourself yes. for a little bit and then you can <laughs> go into what is the Trinity? Why do you believe it is true? And thankfully, the if you push back on a couple of points that Roger said, no, I won't. it'll still be fair. Because okay, okay, no, I, won't. And I was going to say, I was going to say, our the scriptures are literally pointing out the uh, that where 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 well, he already you began. Differ on. No, he already so, began to make an exegetical case for his position. So I'll interact. But praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust the Father of our Lord Jesus to anoint me by His Spirit to speak truth without error. For the glory of Jesus Christ in Jesus name <clears throat> now I'm a full-time apologist I got involved in apologetics because of Muslims <clears throat> I started writing for a website called answering Islam which you can find answering Islam .net in 1999 and I've interacted with Muslims Joe's witnesses and oneness because common thread among all of them is <clears throat> an attack on the triunity of God so that's what I've been doing by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and it's the Holy Spirit that qualifies me to do this, so he gets the glory for anything good I do. And all the mistakes and perfections are my fault. So may the Lord Jesus be glorified in that sense. Now, you can start timing me if you want. Let me know. All right. Okay. Yeah, and I'm glad that when I say opponent, I say this respectfully. I'm not saying my opponent, my enemy. You know, you understand. My opponent in this discussion, I am so glad he went to the Old Testament. I'm so glad he's studying Hebrew because he's going to make my case for me. He's going to end up proving that the Hebrew language does not prove that God is a singular person because you heard the assertion that the singular verb bara in Genesis 1 1 means a singular person. No, it doesn't. It means a singular God because I'm going to demonstrate from the scriptures, the Old Testament being the foundation, because that's what I do. I try to prove the triunity of God from the Old Testament because the Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. And this silences not just modalists, but Joe's witnesses and Muslims who all think the Old Testament supports their position. So contrary to what you hear, singular pronouns, singular verbs do not prove that God is a singular person because I'm going to demonstrate that you have the Hebrew Old Testament using singular verbs and pronouns and participles of entire nations. Nations are described with singular pronouns and verbs and participles, but no one in their right mind would think that that's referring to a single person. So just because singular verbs, pronouns are used of God doesn't mean he's a singular person. Notice he assumed that when he said, Singular creator, singular person. No, the creator is one, but he's not one person. Because on top of that, you will find, and he's going to help me confirm this, especially when we go to Isaiah, specifically Isaiah 54, 5, where you'll find plural participles used of God, plural verbs used of God, plural pronouns used of God. So for a Trinitarian, it poses no problem that singular verbs, pronouns are used of God. We would expect that because God is one. But now you have to define in what sense is he one? Is he one person or is he one being? And that being is shared by more than one person. But the problem for the modalist, as well as the Muslim, the Jehovah Witness, is that if their position is true, you should not expect to find plural pronouns, verbs, participles, used of God if it's a singular person. So again, let me repeat the point. From a Trinitarian perspective, we expect to find singular verbs, singular pronouns, Participles used of God because God is one in one way, but we should not expect to find plural verbs, plural participles, <clears throat> plural pronouns used for a singular person. And I'm going to challenge him on grammatical grounds to show me when in the Old Testament does it ever use plural participles for a singular person? 
It's used for collective singulars, where you have several persons or a nation grouped together as a collective whole. So singular pronouns will be used in them and verbs as well as the plural. But that actually proves my point, that God is one in one way, but more than one in another way. So by the grace of the triune God, the only true God that exists, I will demonstrate the Old Testament does not teach God as a singular person, perfectly comporting with the New Testament that doesn't teach that God is a singular person. And so Mr. Perkins already knows what I believe is a Trinitarian, that there is one God, but this one God is more than one person or relationship. Now, I hope I don't have to define the term person because he already knows what we mean by person and what we don't mean by person. So hopefully we'll have a fruitful discussion. And I thank God he's studying Hebrew because he's going to confirm my arguments when I ask him to tell me what form do we find this word in the Hebrew. So by the grace of the triune God, let's begin so that Jesus Christ will be glorified. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Here is what uh, we so here's going to be the format for so that you gentlemen are familiar with it as well as those who are listening. The format that we hold when we have these doctrinal discussions is we have select scriptures and we park on those scriptures. So there are countless debates, dialogues that you can find online and you can actually learn from them, you know, but we're going to park at certain scriptures. We're going to park at certain scriptures for 15 minutes at a time. And these two gentlemen are going to dialogue. Now, there will be a cap on how long they can ultimately talk. You know, so if if their response, it doesn't have to be two and a half minutes long. But if it happens to go that long, they'll hear me say, hey, you got to wrap up your thought uh, so that the other person can respond to you. So we have uh, five or six scriptures and we're going to park there for 15 minutes out of t at a time. And that's going to be our doctrinal discussion, how we're going to conduct this dialogue. Now, there are a couple of rules that these gentlemen have agreed to. Um, no name calling, as I've said already. No, no yelling. You know, we're not going to raise our voice and get out of character because uh, people who are listening and viewing won't learn that way. Uh, and we also we don't want to bring up uh countless different scriptures from elsewhere when exegeting a particular text. Now, mind you, I want to put that in context. When exegeting a text, it is absolutely necessary at times to bring up something else from a different chapter or another book or maybe even a couple other books. That That is fine when it is necessary. The reason this rule is in place is so that someone, not saying you two gentlemen won't do it, but this is a rule anytime someone comes on so that someone doesn't start talking about eight different scriptures and never even focus on the scripture that's actually at hand. So with that said, our very first scripture, and I'm actually going to take myself out of the screen. Yes. And By the way, real quickly, uh, how many minutes for each scripture? I didn't get them. Forgot. To uh, we're going to, we're going to park 15 minutes at a time. Oh, okay. Excellent. Yeah. 15 minutes at a time. And Wait, so y'all. Oh. Okay. Oh. Is he timing it already? Where we at? Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, did he begin it? I don't know. I'm confused. Did he begin? I, I don't know. I have no idea. Same thing. Okay, maybe you can tell us. Hey, did, is it starting? <laughs> I get. I don't know. I have no idea. Could you okay. ask him to see if he was, your, your your time is beginning or not? I have no idea. But anyway, y'all couldn't hear me when I was talking. What's going? Okay. All right. So even though this ain't live, okay. I think I just fixed it. I think I know what I did here. Yeah. All right, so I was still talking and y'all couldn't hear me. That's my bad. I apologize. No, so I'll, I'll say this again. All right, so Roger Perkins will have the first go okay. at this, and our scripture is Isaiah 44 24. Now, again, we will be going, we will be parking here for 15 minutes, okay? And each gentleman, they'll respond 
if they don't go up to two and a half minutes, that's fine. But two and a half minutes is the max that each person can go each time they ultimately talk. Roger, you have the first word. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have the first word. And again, the scripture here is Isaiah 44, 24. And the Bible says, thus says the Lord, your redeemer who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Roger, you have two and a half minutes to go ahead. Okay, number one, uh, well, I guess I can probably correct this later, but we do not go by the term modalist. We do not use the expression modalist. So we'll deal with that a little bit later on. And yeah, I'm glad that I'm studying Hebrew too, because it disproves the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, I want to note here, verse 24, thus says the Lord. And when I click on says here, it is a Katal third person, you listen, masculine singular. By the way, my opponent did not address the masculine singular that I brought up in Genesis 1-2. Um, redeemer here. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, Redeemer, masculine singular, who formed, who formed, cal participle, masculine singular participle. If he's going to emphasize the the uh, participles and the, the parsing of them, then uh, I will too. That's what we need to do. This is masculine singular. You have a noki, uh, I think that's a noki, yeah, first person pronoun where he says, I am the Lord who made, who made cal participle masculine singular absolute things, who alone, alone, uh, common masculine singular construct, uh, stretched out cal participle masculine singular absolute, who spread out, et cetera, et cetera. For the sake of time, I could go right down the, the, uh, the line with this. There is, to my knowledge, no plurality in Isaiah 44 and 24. Um, and so, I, and I do have a response for the for the uh, plurals that Mr. Shamoon quite often uses, but I won't address them right now. I'll just wait till we get into that. How many time do I have left, Leda? Okay, I don't know if he can hear me or not. Last thing then, I would just ask Mr. Mr. Shamoon to provide where... That, 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 that was my bad. So you got you got a minute, 30 seconds left. And again, we're exegeting Isaiah 44, 24. Yeah. Oh, a minute and a half left. OK, good. Um, so I, I would just ask Mr. Shamoon to provide an example of where a speaker is speaking and he uses the singular first person pronoun to be more than one person. I'm sure he's going to go to Genesis 5 and Adam and Eve and all that, but I'll just wait until he goes there before I address it. Simply, the verbs are all conjugated in the singular masculine first person in this text. And there is additional information there as well. Uh, we could actually go to the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is a very powerful uh, text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Scrolls, But I won't go there right now. Um, it, let's see. In other words, God is asking a rhetorical question. Okay, yeah. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, it said, who was a partner with me, single person pronoun, in creation, Davidson's Hebrew syntax, third edition, sections 20, uh, under the article, he says, words may be determinate in themselves or from construction, and with these, the article is not used. Note this, words definite of themselves are, A, proper names of persons, countries, cities, rivers, and then he gives the example in order, such as Yahweh, Moses. He says persons. And then he applies that to Yahweh of the Old Testament and then uses Moses uh, as well. Again, Barah is, in, is the first verse we have in the Bible about uh, creation. And it's masculine singular. So that will, anything that comes after that will have to be uh, commensurate with that, with what it says in the second uh, verb in the Bible. All right. First so verb, I'm sorry. All right. So, Sam, you have an opportunity to respond. Sure. And I'll remind both gentlemen that when we are going back, that when we are conversing, we are talking about the specific uh, scriptures alone. We're, we're, we're not going different places. I'm saying that to both of you, sure. gentlemen. Sam, you have an opportunity to respond. Go ahead. Yeah. By the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, I just want to correct him. I did address his claim about the singular verb bara. And I clearly stated that singular verbs do not prove that the creator is a singular person. 
He's assuming what he's yet to prove. Singular verbs, all they do is prove there's one creator. But is that one creator a singular person? He has yet to prove that. So now I'm going to prove my case from Isaiah itself. <clears throat> now, I don't know why he thinks the singular conjugation of Isaiah 44, 24 somehow refutes Trinitarianism. He knows what Trinitarianism teaches, so I hope he doesn't attack straw man, because we expect singular verbs, participles to be used of the one true God. What we don't expect to find if he's a singular person is when plural verbs, participles, <clears throat> and so on are used. So in Isaiah 54, 5, and I want him to conjugate this in his response to me, and I hope he doesn't say that's because it's corresponding to Elohim, because Elohim is not used <clears throat> in the sentence in which the plurals are used <clears throat> in Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. So now we got the Lord of hosts is his name, but your maker and your husband are plural. They're not singular. It's the plural of Asa and Baal, because he knows that the word Baal can mean husband, <clears throat> Lord, or master. So here you have the plural participle form of Asa and Baal. Literally, it's for your makers are your husbands. The Lord of hosts is his name. Exactly what a Trinitarian expects to find. The use of the singular and the plural together because the one God is more than one person, even though he's one God. But a oneness, because he got offended at the term modalist, a oneness <clears throat> shouldn't expect this if he's consistent. Because again, if there's a singular person, then we shouldn't expect plurals use of, of Yahweh if he's a singular person. Now, to bring up cor corroborating evidence that the one creator is also identified as a plural creator, not more than one God, but that this one God is more than one person. Again, Ecclesiastes 12, 1. Remember also your creator. Surprise, surprise. The word creator here is the plural participle of bara. The very verb used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. So literally, it's remember also your creators. Exactly what a Trinitarian expects to find. That the one God is more than one person, so that the Hebrew Old Testament will reflect that by using both singular and plural forms of these words for the one true God. But a oneness shouldn't expect to find this, and this is why he's going to have to try to explain it away. But again... It's not just Ecclesiastes or Isaiah. Now, here you have in Job 35, verse 10. But none says, where is God, my maker? Guess what? Here the word my maker is the plural participle form of Asa, my makers. So again, this is what I'd expect to find if the Hebrew Bible teaches the one God is more than one person. But this is not what you should expect to find if oneness is true. And then finally, Psalm 149, verse 2. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Again, what do we have here? We have the plural participle form of Asa. So it's his makers. So as a Trinitarian, I expect to find singular verbs, participles, <clears throat> pronouns used of the one true God, along with plural. But I want to hear him explain how as a oneness he accounts for the plurals. And I hope he doesn't try to appeal to the word Elohim because in some of these examples, Elohim is not used. I don't know how much time I have, but I'll stop right wrap it up now. Awesome. Roger, go ahead and respond. How much time do I have? Two minutes? Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, several points to address. Uh, for, uh, number one, it's not enough merely to say that there's a singular that is used in, for example, Isaiah 44, 24, where he... Uh, that he, that the subject that we're talking about, the scripture we're talking about, it's a masculine singular. Mr. Shamoon did not include that in his presentation. Uh, so it's a masculine singular. Also, uh, I think he said Isaiah 54 and 5. Yep. You'll hear me. Okay. So I'm in the, okay. So for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Guess yeah. what his, yeah, exactly. Guess what his is? It's a masculine singular. And the Holy One of Israel, I hope he doesn't try the Holy One's thing that he pulls in Proverbs 30, but we'll see. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. Guess what we have, folks? Masculine singular. For the Lord has called you. Uh, regarding the, this, the husbands, let me, look, let me click on that and look. Husband, verb, yes. 
Good. Um, yeah. So, so this is a cow participle masculine plural construct. Exactly. We, we know that. Plural. Yeah. Exactly. However, uh, the problem is that people like Mr. Shamoon, uh, other apologists that I'm well familiar with, they will appeal to the Septuagint when they think it supports them. For example, Genesis 126, etc. But why don't they do that here? You think there might be a reason? I think there is. The reason why is because guess what? You don't have a plural in the Septuagint. Neither do you have a plural in the Septuagint for Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. And finally, I would just say in response to him that if you're going to interpret this as multiple persons in the Godhead, then why stop at three? Why not have 3,000? You would have zero. Uh, you have no defense against polytheism. And I would imagine you're probably going to say, well, the same reason you uh, have three manifestations. But again, I don't want to address your um, argument that you're not making. So I'll just wrap it up by pointing out that we have masculine singular for the name and also for his call and many other things. I'm going to look at maker here. Maker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, masculine plural. That's right. However, uh, the again, the Septuagint does not use that. So you can't appeal to the Septuagint when it supports your doctrine, or you think it does, and then neglect that same doctrine or same source whenever you, it, it refutes your doctrine. All right. Sam, go ahead. Yes. Two minutes. Uh, notice the bait and switch tactic here. He appealed to the Hebrew Old Testament. So I'm appealing to the Hebrew Old Testament. Now, notice I want everyone to pay attention to what he did. When the Hebrew Old Testament proved too much for him to handle, he ran to the Greek version. Let's put this in perspective. Let's put in context because I want the people to remember who appealed to the Hebrew language. Mr. Perkins did. So now I followed suit and I said, thank you for appealing to the Hebrew language because it's going to end up refuting you. And he just refuted himself. Do you see how what a big deal he made up? Well, it's a singular masculine, masculine singular. But did you hear he just admit that makers and husbands – they are masculine plurals. So what does the masculine singular prove? Absolutely nothing. It doesn't support your case. It supports mine. Masculine singular verbs and pronouns and participles is what a Trinitarian expects to find because there's only one God. But you as a oneness, that's why you ran to the Septuagint. See, now you abandoned the Hebrew because the Hebrew proved too much for you to handle. And I don't blame you because these plurals are a nightmare for oneness theology. So what you do, you abandon your appeal to the Hebrew because you're the one who said, I'm taking Hebrew and Hebrew exegesis and Hebrew grammar. And you appeal to the Hebrew and the conjugation is this. When I use the Hebrew to refute you, you ran to the Greek. So, but again, if you want to stick to the Greek version, that will be a nightmare for your position as well. But let me remind you what he just said. He just admit it's masculine plural. And I said, as a Trinitarian, I expect to find singular verbs, participles, <clears throat> pronouns used with plural ones if God is one in one way more than one in another way but that's not what you should, should expect to find if you are a oneness and that's what he is so again notice how he tried to make a big deal masculine singular but my friend Mr. Perkins maker and husband they're masculine plurals so what does the masculine prove if they're plurals that means what they're three male entities or are you now abusing the language because you and I both know that the Hebrew term will often, the nouns and the verbs and adjectives, will often have gender assigned to it without telling us the gender of the thing that these verbs or pronouns or participles are describing. For example, in Hebrew, roach is feminine. Thought, should, I assume, should I assume that the Holy Spirit is a female? Wisdom is feminine. Hukma, should I assume that wisdom is the woman, the consort of Yahweh? So again, you prove nothing. You prove my position. Yeah. And thank you for making my case for me. All right, uh, Roger, you get the last word on this. Two okay. minutes. Okay, yeah, this is a common theme in Mr. Shamoon's uh, presentations. I haven't listened to a presentation yet where he doesn't get up and say that. He says the same thing over and over, that we are making his position. No, we're not, friend. Uh, and you did not address the masculine singular of the second word in the Bible. I'm honest with it and saying, yeah, we have a masculine plural here. I'm not running to the Septuagint for safety. I quoted the Hebrew and was honest about that. But that does not prove a triune divinity. You are reading your presupposed theology into the text. Uh, and no Jew would believe that. And please appeal to Alan Siegel's work. I, I want you to. Um, so we have masculine singular. And he said the masculine doesn't matter. Are you serious? 
my professors would howl me out of the classroom if I made that statement. No, it does matter. Unbelievable. Uh, what else? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Unbelievable. Exactly. Um, oh, okay. oh, oh, last thing. Um, the 9,000 single person pronouns. If God is a triune divinity, as, as Mr. Shamoon says, how on earth are you going to fit three persons into single person pronouns? And I know he's going to run to Genesis 5 probably, and I hope he does. But we're discussing Isaiah uh, 44, 24 tonight right here. And there is no plurality in Isaiah 44, 24 in the strongest way. He says, I, single person pronoun, masculine singulars, did all this by myself and no one was with me. Again, the second word in the whole Bible uses the masculine singular. So I understand you don't like the masculine singular. If I was a Trinitarian, I wouldn't either. However, uh, that's just the fact, my friend. That's just the inspired data. Your, your plural does not prove a triune, triunity of persons. Again, you might have 3,000. Why are you stopping at three? So I would just wrap that up with that. All right. You was right on time. You was right on time. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for that. So our next scripture and Sam, you will have the first go at this. The next scripture that we're going to is a popular one. We are going to exegete John chapter one, verse one. And let's park here. And the word of God says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Sam, you get the first go at it. What are we reading okay. here? All right. Uh, hopefully, by the grace of God and the interaction that later on when we interact, I can get to answer some of the statements he made about the singular uh, again. But anyway, let's focus on John 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> let's do this and start the timer. OK, now here's the thing. And I'm sure Mr. Perkins has heard this because he's debated others. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God, prostantheon. Now, he's aware of prostantheon, but here is what I am going to ask him to address. <clears throat> Because from my understanding, the word is not an internal, distinct, divine person in fellowship with the Father before creation because that's not compatible with oneness. Now, you can correct me if he has a different form of oneness theology. I haven't heard. That's fine because I don't listen to his talks or read his articles. But that's fine by the grace of God. So, prostantheon. Now, why is this significant? And I want him to hear me clearly because he does Greek grammar. Every time John uses prostantheon or Proston Patera in reference to Jesus in John as well as in, in his epistle. It always refers to an actual face-to-face -face communion and not some simply an idea that becomes realized in historical Jesus. What do I mean by that? If you go to John 13, 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Now, he knows the Greek here. Going back to God is pros ton theon. Now, why is this interesting? Because notice the parallel. It says that Jesus knew he had come from God and was going back to God. Now, I know Mr. Perkins will not have the audacity to say that Jesus going back to God isn't actual, that he didn't go to God, pros ton theon, as an actual person distinct from God in fellowship with God, unless he wants to say, that yes, he didn't go back as a person. I'll let him make his case so I can address it thoroughly. So then why then depersonalize the first part of the sentence? He came forth from God and he's going back to God, prostantheon. Going back to God, if he's going there as an actual person in fellowship with the Father, then coming from God, he must have been an actual person in fellowship with the Father, which is precisely what John 1, 1 and 2 state. Now, finally, because I know time is running down, John 16, 25 to 31. Here, Jesus says he's not speaking in figures of speech. It's not figurative language. He's speaking plainly. And what does he plainly say? He goes, but I will plainly tell you about the Father. And that day you'll ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. And now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. So the leaving the world is actual and personal. And he's going to the Father as an actual person in fellowship with the Father. Right, so then why, why do you personalize the first part? If the second part is actual personal, then the coming into the world is actual personal. And then the disciples say, now you speak plainly. And because of this, we believe you came from God. Right. All right, Roger, go ahead and respond. Okay, yeah. Um, first place, uh, the, the, the John 
one one thing, the Prasan Theon. Now, let me say first, uh, maybe I didn't make it clear. In fact, I think I didn't make it clear in my opening statement. We believe there's a distinction between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So you can quote Father, Son, Holy Spirit all day long. We believe that, but we do not believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, to his, let me go straight to his argument from John with the Prasan Theon. I'm aware that he makes that argument quite often. So let me just point this out. He is, and he does this a lot too. He is conflating the categories. Whenever Jesus says in John, what was it, 13, 3, I think, in John 13, 3, I'm going back to God, Prostan Theon, that was a human being that was saying that. God in the flesh was saying, I'm going back to, or I'm going to Prostan Theon, to, by the way, Tan is the, to the God. Um, so using Mr. Shamoon's hermeneutic, if he's going to be consistent, he's going to have to say that in the first part of that clause, when Jesus came from heaven as a pre-existent son, he came as a human person. Because when it says in, in, in the second clause that he appealed to consistency of how we exegete the clauses, he says, well, that's a, you know, that, that's a person going to. Yeah, but it proves too much. It is, it's not just a person. It's a separate human being. It is a human being going, so I'm going to ask him to take his own medicine. If whenever Jesus is going to, that's a human person. When he came, was that a human person too? Same thing in Prostan Patera in John chapter 16. So that does not help him at all. That actually refutes uh, what he is saying. I know he thinks that's, a, that's an argument that's, that's earth-shattering. He uses it all the time, but it proves too much. Not to mention you would have separ uh, bodily separation within the Godhead with radically separated minds um he didn't really exegete anything other than prostan theon so i'll just leave it at that i hope he addresses the rest of john 1 1 though yeah all right sam go ahead and respond yeah glory to jesus it is earth shattering but not for me but for his position because <laughs> he claimed notice what he claimed see if i'm consistent he went back as a human being because that's a, that's going to backfire against him because he's admitting when he went back he didn't simply go back in his idea he went back as an actual person which he calls a human being the reason why I'm not inconsistent, but he is, and he just made my case, even though he doesn't like me to say he's making my case, is because John 1.1 1, 1 told us that when the word was with God, he wasn't flesh. Because 14 says he became flesh when he entered the world. So no, it makes my case, and you just made my case. I know you don't like to hear it, Mr. Perkins, but thank you for helping me prove the truth of the Trinity. Because John 1 says, <laughs> the word was with God, and he entered the world. That's when he became flesh. So now... You're stuck. So here's my question again. Since you just admit prostantheon, proston patera, in those passages, they're not figurative because he says I'm speaking plainly, means Jesus went there as an actual, what you said, human being, but that means he's there, distinct from the Father, in your view as a human being, that means he went there personally to have communion with the Father. Why then do you depersonalize the first part? So I answered your objection. Please answer mine because it is earth shattering, but for your position. The word was not flesh because 14 tells us he entered the world to become flesh. But he was there as a person in fellowship with God the Father, which your view cannot handle, cannot deal with. So if he went to the Father as a person, but this time as an embodied person, then the coming down to the earth means he must have been a person that came down and that's when he became flesh. So thank you again for making my case for the Trinity. Glory to the triune God. Good. Do I get to respond now? Yes. Okay. Go good. Good. So, so you see now he's moving the goalposts. He doesn't like that because it proves too much. It's a human being. I'm asking you, you can go to John 14, 114. We're exegeting John 1, 1 now. And, and by the way, I haven't seen any exegesis of John 1, 1. Just simply quoting a prepositional phrase is not uh, exegesis. So whenever he goes back, you said it yourself. He's going back as a human being, God in the flesh. We believe that. We believe there is an ontological distinction between father, son, and, and, and well, the father and the son. Um, we also believe there's a distinction in the roles that they take, what Trinitarians would call uh, the economy, Trinitarian economy. So I don't really have any other response than to say he came down. We don't say, by the way, he came down as a merely a, an idea, uh, but it was the God that came down. Um, I wish we had time to get into the Coel's rule and the missing article because I would love to, to get into that. But he came down as God. That's our point. He was not 
He was not the second person in a trinity. He was God. And John 1, 1 says that. You know, I read John 1, 1 for years. Never crossed my mind that this was distinct persons until I heard a Trinitarian say this. So the Logos was with, by the way, the God, Kai Theos, and God was the word. Um, again, I hope we come up, with, we can have a discussion on that. But this pose is no problem. He said it himself. When he's going back, he's going back as God, the God in the flesh, the human Messiah. But when he's coming, he's coming as God Almighty. He's not coming as a member of the Trinity. He's coming back as the one God of the Bible. How much Sam, time go I ahead. Have? How much time I have before I go? This one's going to curious. Uh, you got two and a half minutes. Okay, yes. Now, notice, again, he misrepresented my position. He goes, as I said, he went back as a human being. This is recorded. People say, I said, no, as you said, I was quoting him. I'm not denying Jesus was a human being when he entered the world to become flesh. And then when he went back, obviously, he was in his flesh body. You emphasized human being. And I said, thank you, because now you're admitting that the going back was the going back of a person, not simply an idea. Now, here's what's ironic. I will challenge anyone to understand anything Mr. Perkins said about the exegesis of John 1 1. He said that the word is God Almighty in the flesh, but it doesn't mean the second person, of the Trinity. I guess he didn't understand the point of me referring to the preposition, and I was doing exegesis. The word was with God. If he's with God, that means there's a distinction. Just like he believes the human being, Jesus, went to heaven to the Father. So you have a human Jesus with the Father. Unless he's telling me, Somehow that human being who's in fellowship with the father is simply the father in fellowship with himself in a different mode, even though he doesn't like the term. So if Jesus is distinct from the father when he prostantheon, prostant petera, when he went back to heaven, then that means John 1, 1 shows that the word is a distinct person from the God he's with. And we know who the God he, he, he is with happens to be because John 1, 14 says the word became flesh. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And this is confirmed in 1 John 1, 2, where it says the eternal life that was with the Father, prostan patera. So the word was with the Father, and the word is not the Father, even before creation, even before he became flesh. He is a divine person in fellowship with the Father who becomes flesh and then returns in flesh to resume that fellowship and communion. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity, not oneness. Glory to the Chinese God. Go ahead, Roger. I'm confused here. Hold on one second. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I thought that I get the last word because in the last session, right. you didn't let me. Yeah, you didn't let me respond. So what are you doing now? You do. He's going to respond, and then you get the last word. Oh, I thought this was. Okay, go ahead. No, know, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, bro. I didn't know, man. man I thought it was going to be What's up, man? <laughs> go ahead roger <laughs> so so regarding um i didn't really even take notes because i thought it was his last time but i think he said basically that when he's going back that he was he was quoting me actually when i said he's going back as a human being um that's exactly right and this proves the point he's coming in a different way in what he went back but Mr. Shamoon is conflating the two and saying, see, here we have the same way of him coming if we have him going back. No, we don't. You have him going back as a human being. Uh, he is coming, and when he came down, he came down as God. By the way, prostantheon, it's the definite article, it's the articular noun. You have the tantheon, so he was with the God, which, which we believe that. But he was not with him as a second divine person that no one knew under the Old Testament. I hope he goes to Proverbs 30 at some point. Uh, so, you know, I don't really know what to say beyond that. Jesus is God in the flesh. We believe there's an ontological distinction between the Father and the Son. Um, regarding modalists, I'm just saying that we, I, I, we don't identify ourselves as modalists. That's why I objected to that. But we'll save that for later. So I don't really know what else to say. Um, I wish we had more time. We could just camp out on John 1 1. Maybe we can do that toward the end because I would really love to do that. Okay. Amen. All right, Sam. Yeah. Last How word. Much time I have now? Hold on. How much time I have now? I don't know. Uh, two and a half minutes. Okay. Because I'm confused. Sorry, man. Okay. Now let's begin. Notice again, and I think Mr. Perkins, maybe because we're speaking fast, sometimes he's. I'm going to assume he's mishearing me. I didn't say Jesus went back the same way that he came down. I did not say that. This is being recorded. What I said is that the use of prostan, well, let me explain what I said. Prostan theon means that if the prostan theon means 
that he's going back to God as a person in fellowship with the Father, then the prostanteon John 1, 1 means that the word was there as a person in fellowship with the Father. So no, you don't believe that. You said you do. No, you don't. You don't believe the word is an eternal, distinct, divine person from the Father. You don't believe that. Because if you did, there would be no debate on John 1. But the use of prostanteon, and by the way, we're going to have a field day with Proverbs 30. So I will bring that up by the grace of Jesus. But sticking to this point. The use of prostanteon in John's gospel and his letters show that it refers to two distinct persons in fellowship with one another. When he uses it of the Father and Son, he doesn't simply mean there was the word there somehow in whatever form you imagine him to be because you don't believe he was a divine person distinct from the Father, right? Because his use means that this word was a person in fellowship with another person, that other person's God the Father, so he's not God the Father. Entered the world to become flesh, and then went prostantion in flesh. So the difference is, when he came down, he was in flesh. When he went back, he was flesh. But it's still a person who comes down and a person who goes up, who's not the father, but distinct from the father. You have yet to refute that. And so my point is established by the grace of the triune God. All right. Thank you all so much for that. So uh, just to make it clear, just so I can make sure um, both, both, both of you gentlemen uh know what we're doing so we got a few more scriptures left so what we're doing is each time you go you don't have to go up to two and a half minutes but okay. that is the maximum uh, that, that you can go if you hit two and a half minutes i'm gonna ask you to wrap up your point and whoever i ask to go first is the person who's going to get the last word before we go to the next point so now, with before that you go on, okay, before you, okay, so they understand. Let's say if he goes first, then I respond, then he responds, and I respond, and then he closes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I'm I apologize to Mr. Perkins and you. Uh I didn't, you know, I didn't get the chance to read. So apologize to both of you. I don't mean to, you know, I'm just trying to understand. Ah, so it's all good, my brother. It's all good. And next, Roger, you are going to be able to go first. We will be going to Colossians 2:9. And it's a short verse, and I'm sure as you exegete it, you'll bring it more into context. And Colossians 2, 9 reads as such. For in him, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Go ahead, Roger. Oh, hold up, hold up. No, no, hold up. I muted you. I had you muted. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm go sorry. ahead. Really? Go ahead now. Yeah, go ahead now. I'm we sorry. good now? You guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. The Colossians 2 9. Hadi in alto, katoika, pantam, play, roma, teste, adate, somaticos. Literally, for in him the whole fullness of the divinity. This is what is often not pointed out. You have an articular noun, uh, theodotois, or theodotos, rather, uh, and it, it is an articular noun, so it's definitive, it has a definitive uh, tag to it. So let me go to the syntax real quick. So it starts out with a subordinate clause. I think we all know what a hottie clause is. I would imagine Mr. Shimon would know that. It, it, it's expounding upon verse 8. Then you have the prepositional phrase, in alto, literally in him. Then you have what's called a segment clause, syntactically, where two clauses of the same type are juxtaposed by a conjunction or can be in what's called an ascendetic relationship. So with that, you have, let me get straight to the prepositional phrase, pantan pleroma, or panta pleroma. Literally, all the fullness, taste theotitas, of the divinity, or of the Godhead. So I, I don't, you know, I don't really see, um, honestly, how anyone could read that and would conclude that the Jesus is a second part or a second divine person in the Godhead. Whenever he is, uh, this right here says, no, he's all the fullness. I mean, nobody's going to read that, guys, and if they don't know a thing about the Bible and, and read that and say, oh, okay, there must be a, a trinity. There must be two, three persons in the Godhead. Nobody would do that. But yet, uh, and again, I'm not trying to be ugly. I hope I'm not coming across that way. But yet, that is exactly what a Trinitarians do. They they say, well, this is just saying he's divine. It's just saying it's Godhood, not Godhead. And so, um but but it is an articular noun, theatetas, and if you know anything about Greek, it's, it's actually an attributive article. It is attributing to it definitiveness. Definitively, there is one person in the Godhead, and he is Jesus Christ, because in him dwells all the 
fullness of the Godhead bodily. Just it, it, it's just it shatters Trinitarianism. Uh, let's see, uh, Greek word for pleroma, bower, uh, page six seventy two. It denotes the full measure of divinity. Um, thought, let's see. Okay, so okay, well that's it. I'll just stop right there. All I'll stop. Right. All right, Sam, go ahead and respond. Yeah, well, again, I don't want to take person because I actually enjoy his personality. I actually like Mr. Perkins. He's very animated, emotional like me, and I enjoy that. So don't take anything personal I say, but uh, I have to laugh again because did you notice the bait and switch again? He said that it means the, the articular <clears throat> shows it's definitive, definitively, and then he equates theodotos with person. Did you catch it? So that definitively he is the person. No, that's not what theodotos means. And this is why I'm kind of shocked because you say you're studying Greek grammar and syntax and exegesis and you're appealing to lexicons. Theodotos, here, I'm going to give you Thayer's Greek lexicon, which you know, you know this because it's been used, I'm sure, by other Trinitarians because I was told you debated James White, even though I didn't see the debate. It comes from Theotes. Here's how it's defined. Uh, defined. Deity, the state of being God. Godhead, which you just decried. Godhead, right? Godhood, because Godhead is simply another way of saying Godhood, like <clears throat> uh, manhood. And then it says divinity is essence, difference from quality or attribute. That's all the text is saying. It's saying that Jesus possesses the absolute fullness of that which makes God God, the essence and all its essential properties, which Trinitarian denies it. But you equate it, the Adatas, with a singular person again. And I'm going to challenge you. Quote, one single Greek lexical source or a Greek scholar. Doesn't even have to be Trinitarian. Cite them to say that theodotos means the person of God, meaning the one person of God, as opposed to the essence and the essential characteristics of God. And I'm just going to stick to Colossians 2 9 because if we go to Colossians 1 13 to 20, we're going to have a field day refuting oneness and proving the triunity of God. But I'm going to just stick to Colossians 2 9. So here's my challenge to you. You say you know Greek exegesis, and you're trying to exegete in order to give the impression that you know the Greek, and I'm sorry to say you don't. So quit, quote, one single Greek lexicon, one single Greek scholar that says theodotos means person, singular, who is God, as opposed to the essence and the essential characteristics of deity. Quote the source. Let me hear it. What's the evidence? Your time. Go ahead, Mr. Perkins. My turn. Okay, number one, yeah, I, I am taking uh, second year Greek, and that's exactly why I make the arguments that I make. From what I've seen in Mr. Shamoon's handling of original languages, I, I would guess that he's not had a, a lick of original formalistic university training. That's why he keeps making the mistakes that he's making. So regarding the term Godhead, the auditois, or toss here. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong. I got to do it right now, but whenever I hand it back over to you, it sounds like Mr. Shamoon is saying that that the term Godhead does not refer to the what he would call the divine persons of the Trinity. I know you made that argument last week with Mr. Hedgeman whenever he brought it up, and yet the irony is the next day I looked on your Facebook thing, and guess what you had there? You have an article on your Facebook link where you're talking about, I think it was William Lane Craig, if I'm not mistaken, and how that he did, didn't agree with the Nicene understanding of the three divine persons in the Godhead. So now, whenever we have a verse that clearly refutes, yes, I hope we do go to Colossians 1, by the way, that clearly refutes uh, uh, Trinitarianism, now Mr. Shamoon has to wiggle a little bit and has to get out of it, Whereas when he's arguing for Trinity and he's not paying attention to it and he's not trying to protect his religious tradition, then he says that, oh, well, that's referring to the persons of the Trinity. But then when we have a verse that says all the fullness of the divinity, it's an articular uh, divinity. Uh, you didn't address that. It's an articular uh, divinity that I would like you to say something about at least, a tribute of article. And so it's definiteness. Anybody that's had a half a semester of Greek knows that you have, when you have an article prior to the noun, you have an articular noun, and therefore it's specificity. And so, um, what else? What other argument did he use? I think that's, yeah, oh, oh, so far as lexicons. 
Um, you know, we do not, I'm not saying that we agree with every single phrase that is used in a lexicon. I use that uh, incidentally. Uh, however, no more than you would agree with everything Thayer said, whom you know was a Unitarian. No more than you would agree with the theology of the uh, paraphrase, what is it, the Targum. They, they were Jews. They denied your Trinity doctrine. So if, if you're going to charge me, okay. So if you're going to charge me with that, you need to take your own medicine because you do the same thing. We ready? Yes, sir. All right. Notice the bait and switch again. Notice he keeps doing it. Notice what he just did. He appealed to the Greek and saying the definite, you know, it's definite. And therefore, anyone who knows Greek would understand it's referring to the divinity. Well, I never said it doesn't refer to the deity. My question is, what does the deity mean? And the reason why he can't quote the lexicons to support his position, because no lexicon, no Greek scholar makes the point he did. He's butchering the Greek. So I'm going to reissue my challenge. Quote the Greek authorities that know it's definitive because the article is there before Theodotus. It's taste Theodotus. Quote any Greek scholar, whether Unitarian or Trinitarian, that made the argument you just did because it's definite. It has to mean a person. And notice what you did again, the bait and switch. Who's talking about Thayer's Unitarianism? Thayer's Unitarianism is one thing. I'm talking about his comments on the Greek terms. You can be an atheist and still know what the Greek terms mean. So I like this bait and switch tactic, but it's not getting you far. And you did it with my own words. You quoted something I said on Facebook where I'm using Godhead in a different sense from the way the King James translators used it. When the King James translators translated Colossians 2.9 as Godhead, they meant the same thing as manhood, godhood, that which makes you God, like manhood is that which makes you man. Now, here's what's ironic. You've been appealing to the Greek, but now you abandoned the Greek and you went to the English Godhead to prove. You see, you believe the God is a trinity. So the fullness of the trinity is in him. So what do you want me to do? You want me to stick with English? Abandon the Greek. You want the Greek? It destroys your position. Because the Greek word theodotos does not mean the persons or person of the Godhead. It simply means the divine essence and its essential characteristics, which is why you can't quote a lexical source or a Greek scholar, even an atheist, that agrees with you. So the game is over. Oneness is over. The Trinity lives. Glory to Jesus. All right. Mr. Perkins, you get a chance to respond to that, and you, you'll be able to go two more times. So go ahead and respond hey. to Sam. You. Me? You no, he, he started, though, so he's got the last word. Yeah, I, I was saying, I was telling Mr. Perkins he has two more times. So you can go ahead. Sam will respond, and then you have one more opportunity. Oh, oh okay. okay. I'm sorry. I, I, we're all sorry about that. Good. Well, so, so the it deal be, is, I, well, regarding the, the my term, my expression about the Godhead, I'm pointing out Mr. Shamoon's double standards. And so far as quoting a lexicon, apparently Mr. Shamoon's never heard of the logical fallacy argumentum ad populum. Because when you appeal to the populace for your doctrine, we just all we just will always turn our collar around and go join up with Roman Catholics. We just will join up if we're in the Eastern world, go join Islam. Because if you're appealing to the populace and what they believe, then we're really in a bind. So I have not looked at every single lexicon, but I don't need the lexicon. The, lex the Greek grammar and the syntax, I've already alluded to the syntax. I, I can do it again uh, if you're perhaps not hearing me. It's an attributive article. Greek demands that when you have an attributive uh, um, article prior to the noun, it is specificity. It's saying the divinity, all the fullness of the deity. I know you don't like that because it refutes your, your Trinitarianism. However, you have the article there, and I was pointing out your, your double standards regarding the term Godhead. Last week, you said, well, it don't mean the persons of the Trinity. And then the next night, you post something <laughs> on your Facebook that says it's the persons of the Trinity. So it sounds to me like you need to make up your mind. And regarding taking Greek and Hebrew, yes, this is exactly the point. That is why I reject the doctrine of the Trinity. I am forced to, if I'm going to be honest with the original language, yes, I want to be saved. And I want them to hear me to be saved as well. I have to, if I'm going to be honest with the inspired data. Back over to you. You know, I'm beginning. All right, Sam, go ahead and respond. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, and I'm laughing because uh, 
I don't know what to say to such argumentation because he not only misrepresents the sources, he quotes, he misrepresents me. I never denied that it's definitive, that it's referring to the deity. Go back and listen. I never denied it. I denied his assertion that the deity somehow means the one person of God because he's assuming the Godhead, as he's defining it, means the person, one person. And I'm simply stating the obvious. The reason why it's definitive, because Jesus possesses the divine essence. And there's only one divine essence. But that doesn't mean there's only one divine person. You're butchering the Greek. And again, talking about logical fallacies, you don't know what a logical fallacy is. Because I'm not appealing to the populace. Because Greek language is Greek language. And like all language, it's governed by rules. So if you have Greek scholars who are studying the Greek language to know what those rules are and to discover how that language works, and they all say the same thing, then that means you're playing fast and loose with the Greek. You don't know Greek. You pretend you do. And they say a little Greek is dangerous. Well, you are a beautiful example of that because that's why you abandon the lexicons and the dictionaries and the commentators. So they're all biased towards Trinitarianism. Thayer is not a Trinitarian, according to your own words. He's a Unitarian. But he admits theotes, theodotos, does not mean person, divine person. It means essence. And yes, Jesus does possess that essence that makes God what he is. But it doesn't mean it's a singular person. Because the Bible, if you let it speak, the Father possesses the full essence of deity as the Son and the Spirit. Because the Bible describes all three as being that one true God. And if you're one, that one true God, then you possess that specific essence that's true to the one true God, and it's not oneness, it's Trinitarianism. So even though you tried your best, you again, you made my case. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Keep going. <laughs> All right. Mr. Perkins, you get the last word. You get the last word. Go ahead. Yeah, I will keep going. Uh, and that's exactly what led me out of Trinitarian churches is studying of the word of God. So, you know, I would really like to hear how much formal training, university training you've had in original languages. And no, this is not a debate over who's got the most Greek or Hebrew. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying the elementary mistakes that you make all the time with Greek and Hebrew, uh, uh, that is that indicates someone who is self-taught because the mistakes you make are unbelievable. Now, the reason that I'm saying one person is because of the context, the, what is it? It's an adverb of manner, I think, somatikos. Uh, yeah, the, the term somatikos is for in him dwells all the fullness of the deity in bodily form. How many persons would that be? One. Secondly, you keep uh, adding into the text about uh, the, the nature, the essence I'd love for you to show us where the word essence appears there. You are extrapolating your Trinitarianism and force feeding it into the biblical data so you can maintain your Trinitarianism. But the Bible itself does not use that expression. Well, in Colossians 2, 9 at least, it doesn't. We can go to Hebrews 1, Caractere, and we can go wherever you want to go. I don't care. But what I'm saying is if you have not had any original language uh, classes, courses, and I don't think you have from just listening to you, then I don't think you should be <laughs> the one correcting someone else when you haven't you haven't even had a had a course yourself. So that's all I will. Oh, oh last thing. So far as the lexicons uh, saying that theodotes denotes a, what a person, I think. Then with that, using your argumentation, if we were to pick up a Hebrew lexicon, I'm I'm saying if we're over there in Jerusalem and we pick up a native speaker Hebrew lexicon. Do you think you're going to find the Trinity in there? Of course not. So using your hermeneutic, no one agrees with you, Mr. Shamoon. So now you need to abandon your Trinity doctrine. And I hope you do and get baptized in Jesus name and get into the church so you can be saved. That's all. 33 reads as this. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, this is Jesus talking. <clears throat> so everyone who acknowledges me before men, 
I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. Sam, uh, go ahead and tell us what you think this is saying. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So I didn't know this passage was going to come up. And since you chose it, then I'll just go ahead and exegete it. Well, I mean, the plain reading of it, obviously, if Jesus is saying, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who's in heaven. Like he's talking about plain language and just anyone reading it, because he was mentioning that when he read John 1, 1, and when he read the context, he couldn't see multiple persons in the Godhead. Anyone reading this passage, just on the on the surface, even if you go back to the Greek, <clears throat> If you want whatever language you want to go to, Jesus is not the Father. So he's going to have to posit that the reason why there's a distinction because this is a human being, and that human being, though possessing the Godhead within him, somehow was still distinct from the Father. And I'd like to hear him articulate what that distinction is because he did say that he believes the fullness of deity <clears throat> dwells in Christ bodily, Godhead, and he means the person. That person is the Father. So now, if that's true, the Father is in Jesus. That means Jesus is the human being <clears throat> that's the Father in human form, human manifestation. I don't want to use the wrong terms because I don't want him to get upset if I say mode. But I don't mean he's a modalist. But still, but the plain language here is Jesus is not the Father. He's distinct from the Father. And <clears throat> the reason why he's distinct from the Father is as Trinitarianism teaches. Jesus is the Son who became flesh. And as a son, he's distinct from the father, remains distinct from the father while on earth and in heaven, remains distinct from him. Because notice he goes at that day because he says, I will deny him before my father in heaven. When does that take place? From the context of Matthew's theology, that takes place when the son of man comes to judge. So he's distinct from the father on earth. He'll be distinct from the father on the day of judgment. That means the plain reading of Matthew is that Jesus is a distinct person. From the Father, the Father's Son, not simply the Father in human form, as a human being in human manifestation. But I want to hear how he's going to exegete it so that I can then <clears throat> piggyback from his exegesis. How does he explain the distinction? Is this a human being who's distinct from the Father? But I thought the human being is the Father because you just got, got done arguing that Jesus as a man possesses the fullness of the Godhead, and that Godhead is a person, and that would be the Father in that body. So there can't be a distinction if that's the Father as a man on earth. But I want to hear you articulate your position so I don't attack straw man so that I can address it. So go ahead. Mr. Perkins, go ahead. Yeah, so Matthew 10, uh, 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, who's the speaker? God in the flesh. I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven it, the the greek preposition before is improsten plus the genitive case what's it's what's called an improper preposition i won't get into too much of that but but here here's the thing this is referring to jesus in his mediatorial role it's the same language that is used elsewhere um not going to go all over the new testament but for example first timothy 2 5 he's the man christ jesus and as the mediator uh the net says who mr shamoon quotes all the time by the way the NET says this acknowledgement will take place at the judgment. On Jesus and judgment, see Acts 17.31. Well, wow, since it's the same topic, what does Acts 17.31 say? He has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man. I know Trinitarians don't like to hear that, but by a man whom he designated. Now, if you're asking my, my position on the Godhead, or rather the Father and Son, Again, we say that there is a distinction between father and son. Uh, we believe there's an ontological distinction between the father and the son. The father is God transcendent. He is, fills, fills uh, heavens, the earth, etc., etc. He's an omnipresent spirit, invisible spirit. The son is that self-same God descendant. And then the Holy Spirit is God in emanation. So, so we believe, you can quote all the verses you want to quote, about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the distinctions, we believe that. What we don't believe, and never will, is you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three separate minds, by the way, as I heard you say earlier when I was listening to a to a response that you said. So with this right here, if, if we stick to the text itself, this is bodily separation. You have 
a body according to Trinitarianism, you would have a God the Son with his own body standing before, which by the way, the Greek before before can mean simply in the presence of. So you, you would have bo okay, bodily separation in the Godhead. If you have bodily separation in the Godhead, that's not now, there never will be monotheism. All right, Mr. Shamoon, go ahead. I want you to see how this position distorts scripture, butchers scriptures, and manhandles scripture. I want you to notice what he said. Pay attention. He said, yeah, Jesus is God in the flesh. Which God in the flesh? The Father. But wait, if he's the Father in the flesh, then how is he going to confess or deny people before the Father? Because that's simply him, but he's in the flesh. So it's one person in the flesh denying people before himself do you understand the incoherent babble this position is and he's talking about trinitarianism and then he said jesus is the self-same god descended what self-same god the father so guys understand the position that's being defended on the basis of scripture which is a distortion of scripture jesus plain language jesus says i will acknowledge confess or deny before my father plain language that is not the father but the son of the father but he just said and i just wrote it down that's god in the flesh which god in the flesh mr perkins oh that's the father in the flesh well that's still the father on earth how can the father in the flesh deny or confess people before the father when he is the father in the flesh is jesus schizophrenic is jesus <clears throat> paranoid because again your position i wrote it god in the flesh self-same god descended what self sin God? So this is the Father in the flesh. So Jesus, aren't you the Father in the flesh? Yes. How are you going to confess and deny anyone before the Father in the Father's presence when you are that Father in the flesh? So are you basically saying you're going to deny people or confess people before your own person, even though you're that person in the flesh? You see, this is the danger with this possession. It makes mincemeat out of scripture. It manhandles scripture. It perverts scripture. It turns Jesus into a liar or the worst communicator that's ever walked this earth because the plain language is he's not the father. He's the son in the flesh, distinct from the father, which is why he can be in the presence of the father, confess people before the father or deny people before the father. But don't forget what he said. And I'm going to hold you to what you said. He is God in the flesh, the self same God in the flesh. So to you, that is the Father on earth, speaking of the Father in heaven. So the Father on earth in flesh is going to deny people before the Father in heaven. But wait, he's going to be in heaven too with the Father. So it is him denying others before himself or confessing others before himself, and you claim to follow the Bible. Okay, even the Greek won't save you here. But go ahead. All right, Mr. Perkins, go ahead and respond. Yeah, so A, you know, the, the expression that he uses of uh, we are distorting scripture, he, he says that probably every day just about, and says that we make Jesus a liar. And yet, somehow Trinitarians can read Isaiah 44, 24 in masculine, singular, and single person pronouns all through the scriptures and somehow cram three separate minds in that, and we're making Jesus the liar? You, that's the problem with Trinitarianism. If we follow what you believe and what you teach, then you're making Yahweh of the Old Testament a liar. And he is not a liar. He is true. Now, I want, I want the people listening to catch what Mr. Shamoon said. He said, which God? Oh, really? Isn't that a nice tacit admission that you have more than one God? See, we don't have that problem. We don't have to throw out tritheism disclaimers all the time. We can just say Jesus Christ is that one God in the flesh. No problem. We don't have to write article after article disclaiming uh, the, the tritheism. I, I read your article the other day on uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 where you say it's literally translated as Hero Israel, the Lord our gods, plural, gods uh, is, is um, in unity. Now, he misrepresents us. He says that we have a schizophrenic Jesus. Uh, and yet, this is the same person that says in Genesis 1.26, this is God talking to himself. But we have a schizophrenic Jesus. The same person that says that that uh, God, or rather like Yahweh, does something on behalf of another Yahweh you use in Genesis chapter 19, and yet we're distorting scripture. Uh, no, not hardly. The schizophrenia would come from those who have more than one God, and God talks to himself, and God prays to himself. And I know you're going to say Father, Son, Holy Spirit, different persons. Uh, that's not in the Bible now. It never will be. 
So the, the idea of us having a schizophrenic Jesus, right back at you. You have a schizophrenic God. You have God standing before God with bodily separation, and then you want to convince us that you're seriously still a monotheist. <laughs> it's like holding up an orange and saying, look at this apple. It's never tri uh, monotheism. It never will be. All right. Sam, go ahead and respond. Yeah, this is the pot calling the kettle black. He just said that I have the schizophrenic deity, even though I believe that there are three persons, not the same person, and can have fellowship and communion with one another. But it's actually his position that has God praying to himself. Because don't forget, and he distorted my argument again. I was quoting what he said. The self-same God descended, God in the flesh. So I'm asking him which God. I'm talking about your view because for you, God is only one person, the Father. But you have to resort to these debate tricks because you can't refute what I'm saying, but that's okay. Repent of what you believe and accept Trinitarianism. But let's go with what you just said. Isn't Jesus the Father in the flesh? Yes, you said that, God in the flesh. So who's God for you here? The Father, God for you. Don't impose your definition of God upon me. Who's the self-same God that descended according to you? That's the Father. So you have the Father in the flesh, Jesus, praying to the Father in heaven, and you still want to convince us your deity is not a schizophrenic deity because that's still the Father praying to himself. That's still the Father being in his own presence. That's still the Father confessing or denying people in his own presence. You're stuck with the schizophrenic deity, not me. Because although God is one, he's more than one person. And you went to Isaiah 44, 24. We already addressed Isaiah 44, 24. And you had nothing worthwhile to say about Isaiah 54, 5. You even admit those are masculine plural participles. And that's what I, what I expect as a Trinitarian. As a Trinitarian, I expect to find plural participles, masculine plural participles. Let me emphasize masculine with masculine singular verbs, pronouns, and participles. If God is one in one way... More than one in another way. And just to silence this argument, because I didn't have the time to rebut you. The Hebrew Bible, because you asked, the singular verbs, why three persons, you know, why not a thousand? Because the Bible, as you acknowledge, though you try to explain it as oneness, only identifies three that can be properly called God. You try to explain it not as persons, but whatever you want. You don't want to use the term mode, so I'll respect you. I won't use the term mode. But my friend, Singular verbs and pronouns are used throughout the Old Testament for thousands of people viewed as a collective whole. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to give you one. Psalm 130, verses 7 to 8. Let Israel, that's a masculine singular proper noun, hope, masculine singular imperative verb, right? But it's referring to the nation made of millions. Let Israel hope, masculine singular imperative verb in the Lord. Now, when we go on, and he shall redeem Israel. Masculine singular pro, uh, proper noun from all his iniquities. Third person masculine singular verb. Why is the psalmist speaking of the nation of Israel as one man using singular verbs? Because that's the beauty of the language. You can talk of a collective unit as one and apply singular verbs, pronouns, and participles to them. But if your view is right, you can't apply plural, plural verbs participles pronouns to god if he's a single person so the gig is up your appeal to hebrew and greek is not helping you and if i have no formal training in these languages what does it say about your formal training you need to give it up because it's not helping you get someone who doesn't have formal training so thank you for glorifying god in me praise the lord jesus christ mr perkins you get a chance to respond yeah he has again said which god uh, he does this all the time and, and he also appeals to uh, nations with the masculine plural as the, I guess in his mind, the representation of the Trinity. But those nations were separate human beings. So again, it proves too much. Just like your appeal to Adam and Eve in Genesis 5 that you do. Um, and you're telling, <laughs> you have bodily separation in the Godhead, and yet you want me to repent. No, you're the one who needs to repent of your false doctrine. Secondly, Whenever you, you mention God, and it's, it, you seem to equate God with Father. I think your argument is that the New Testament, when you say the noun theos, that's referring to the Father. And I would agree with that. I just hope you stick to it in 1 Timothy 3.16. I appealed with Isaiah 54 and 5. I, I showed the inconsistencies of Trinitarianism whenever they appeal to the Septuagint when they think it supports them. And then all of a sudden they drop it like a hot potato whenever it whenever it refutes them. 
So this is called theological agenda. Uh, the and, and by the way, we do not just limit a God to Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe in the Son of Man. We believe in the seven spirits of God, Revelation. So I'm not saying we're referring to them as multiplicity of gods. I'm not Trinitarian. I don't argue that way. However, what we, what we, you're assuming rather that we are just limiting to three uh, titles and, and references. Uh, seems like it was another one. Nothing. Oh yeah, you said that, you said that I uh, offered nothing worthwhile with Isaiah 44:24. If masculine singular uh, uh, participles, if single person pronoun, there is not a plurality anywhere in Isaiah 44:24. If that does not prove something and help somebody, I, I, I don't want to tell you. Uh, you're just cloaked by religious tradition, and your religious tradition will not allow you to accept the Bible on its own terms. You will not allow God to define himself, whereas we do. We're saying Jesus Christ is God Almighty in the flesh. We're not teaching bodily separation like, like you do. So I will just yield my time back over. All right, uh, Sam, you get the last word on this scripture. Yeah. Uh, all right. Glory to Jesus Christ. Uh, notice the straw man, the red herrings, the bait and switch tactics. He said that I seem to equate God with the father. I'm addressing your belief and your statement. You believe God is the father. And you said, let me repeat, God in the flesh, meaning Jesus is God in the flesh. For you, that means the father in the flesh, because God and father are equated in your theology. And you said the self-same God descended. So who is this self-same God? In your theology, God and the Father are synonymous terms. So if you say God in the flesh, you meant the Father in the flesh. So please try to at least address what I'm saying and don't attack straw man and bring up red herrings or bait, bait and switch tactics like this bait and switch tactic, <clears throat> this red herring. I was quoting Psalm 130 to show that singular verbs, <clears throat> pronouns, participles are used all throughout the Old Testament for multiplicity of persons, beings, whatever you want to call it, as a collective whole, in order to show that just because singular verbs, pronouns, participles are used of the true God, that doesn't make him a singular person. So what did he do? He couldn't refute that. He goes, oh, well, if you're consistent, that means you believe in multiple beings in God. No, because God is not identical to human beings. Human beings are not identical to God. His existence transcends that of finite creatures. All I'm doing when I show these examples is to show that your appeal to the Hebrew backfires against you, which you, which is why you had to run to the Greek Septuagint, even though you started with the Hebrew Old Testament. So let me repeat the point, which you badly distorted. When you have the Old Testament using singular verbs, pronouns, participles of multitudes of peoples, of nations, and they're not a single person or a single being, the gig is up. That means you have no case to make just because Isaiah or Jeremiah or Moses uses singular verbs, pronouns, participles <clears throat> for God, because all that proves is that God is one in one way, but it doesn't tell us that he's one person, just like the nation Israel being described with singular verbs. You want, you want me to read it again? You want me to read John, Judges 1, 1 to 4 and other passages? Means that Israel is a single person. Israel is a nation that consists of millions of people. And yet these up. millions of people are grouped together with singular verbs. So the gig is up. You believe Jesus is the father of the flesh speaking to himself, even though you want to deny it. You can't. It's over. The Trinity is true and it's biblical. Go ahead. All right. Thank you all so much, man. I'm having such a great time, uh, man. I know each scripture that we've went over so far, I know that y'all could go for like eight hours each, <laughs> you know, so so uh, I pray that other people listening are having um, a, a blessed time such such as I am. We have two more scriptures. And then if you guys still have enough time, you know, you guys can just kind of freelance uh, and ask each other a couple of questions if time permits. But we have two more scriptures. And this next scripture, Mr. Perkins will have the first go at. And we're going to go back to the Old Testament to Isaiah chapter nine. All right. So we're going to go to Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, where the Bible says for to us, a child is born to us. A son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of 
piece. Mr. Perkins, will you tell us what this is saying? Yes. Um, and, and yeah, I hope we do have a few minutes. Uh, I won't have a whole lot of time, but maybe towards the end of this, we can have a few minutes because I definitely want to correct some of his straw mans and outright false information. Okay. What he just said. Isaiah, Isaiah 9 6. Um, so, the, the, okay, the name, we're very familiar with this. I heard your presentation on it last week, Mr. Shamoon, but as he quoted, for to us a child is born, to us son is given, the government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In, in the Hebrew classes I was taking, I was reading a, a book the other day entitled Reading Biblical Hebrew for Comprehension. Um, and this is what they say. It's under Lesson 10. Proper noun. A proper noun is names of people, places, etc., such as Jerusalem, Moses, and God. Remember, proper nouns, names are always definite, even though they may lack the article. What this means is that whenever you read Isaiah 9, 6, you have not just mighty God in the sense of qualitative, uh, but you have the mighty God. You have the eternal father. So there is, there is, there, I know you're going to try to move around it, but there is no response to that, but I'm sure you're going to try to give one. So let's look at the vocabulary. Noun, or rather, uh, what is it? Yelid. Yella is child. Uh, Lod is to bear. And let's see. We go, okay. We could go all the way down with this, but you have the adjective. Let me look here on my other source real quickly. Um, yeah, so it's nothing different than I've just told you. So simply put, this is an identification of, of, of Jesus Christ. I think we agree on that. But who does it say he is? It says he's the mighty God, he's the eternal father, and if he's not really the eternal father, like the text plainly says that he is, then A, how many fathers do you have in the Godhead? B, then then is he also not uh, Sar Shalom, the, the Prince of Peace, or is he also not Wonderful Counselor, or is it only the one <laughs> about the Eternal Father that we have to dance on to get rid of it? Um, I'm going to close with this. Pulpit. Uh, pulpit. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, the response usually, the all-repeated assertion is that Everlasting Father equals Father of Eternity. Father doesn't denote Jesus as God the Father. just simply means that Jesus is the possessor of eternity. I hope you make that argument because you made it last week, and I'll address it when you do. But we know this is referring to Jesus Christ. And here it literally it, it, it defines him as the mighty God, because it's definitive in the construct, and the eternal Father. Again, I'm going to say that no one is going to read that and say, oh, well, you know, Jesus is someone other than the Father or someone other than the mighty God. And bear in mind, Wait, Mr. Perkins. okay, bear in mind, these are Jews that are writing. And I know you think that proves that they're, they're Trinitarian, but I'll address that later. Back to you. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, okay. By the grace of Jesus Christ, I'm glad he heard my presentation because he won't be able to refute it. He just said that. This is the one title, or what he said, proper name, that we Trinitarians deny, but we would affirm all the other titles. This, again, is a straw man, which means he cannot actually address what we actually believe. No one denies that all of these titles are applicable to Jesus. It's what do they mean. And these are dis descriptive nouns, not so much proper names as he'd like you to believe, but I'll even get, grant him that. These are proper names. The real question is, because he claims to know Hebrew, what does Abiad mean? Now, here in my presentation. And is appealing to Jewish sources and lexicons. We're going to have a field day. So, you, excuse me. So, you know, this is not just my position. The complete Jewish Bible, and he will be given the name Pele Yoetz El Gibor Aviad Sar Shalom, and then in brackets, Wonder of a Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity. Oh, surprise them, surprise! A Jew who knows Hebrew translates it as Father Eternity. Now, Darby, which is a little outdated, says, and his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity. So the real question is, he is Abiyad. What does that mean? And he asked me, how many fathers are there in the Godhead? That depends on how you define the term father. If you restrict the meaning of father to mean the person that you call father who happens to be God, we're going to have a field day because you'll find passages in which God is mentioned as Father along with someone else, and yet you would not reason that that makes him God the Father. For example, in John 8, 39 and 41, John 8, 39 and 41, they answered him, Abraham is our father. 
Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of your father. They said to him, we were not born of sexual morality. We have one father, even God. Using Mr. Perkins, <clears throat> Isagesis, and butchering of the scriptures. They just said, Abraham's our father, but we have one father, God. He just made Abraham, God the father, in the flesh. So the self-same God became Abraham. Wow. I'm ready now to believe you have now multiple manifestations of the Father. The Son of Man, the seven spirits, and Abraham, and the rest. Obviously, no Trinitarian denies that Jesus is Abiyad. And since he's appealing to Jews who say they're not Trinitarians, I'm going to challenge him. I want you to quote a rabbinic source that says that this child is Yahweh the Father. Because you're appealing to the Jews. Everyone heard you. Jews are not Trinitarians. Okay, quote a rabbi or a Jew that says Isaiah 9, 6 means the child is the Father in heaven becoming flesh. You mentioned the Jews, not me. So let's have a field day and quote your authority. The term abiyat, as I've demonstrated, and you won't be rabbi able to refute, so. simply means father of eternity. And you know what the word abi or ab can mean in the Hebrew such as Abigail. Tell us what Abigail means. Can you do us a favor? Please define Abigail. What does that word mean? Because Abiyat simply means that this one possesses life and he confers life in union with the Father and the Spirit, exactly what the New Testament teaches. But go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Parkins. Okay, A, he accuses me of Jesus, and yet he worships a three-minded God, has no problem saying it all over the place. All you do is pull up his name online. He, he No problem saying that. The problem is that uh, whenever he see he appeals to the Jews, like, for example, in his articles regarding the uh, two powers of, of, uh, of heaven, Alan Segal's work, and then also the Second Temple uh, Judaism. He appeals to them when he thinks it supports him. But when it doesn't support him, again, like they always do, he drops it like hot potato. So I don't understand the argument really that you're making about God and Abraham. I don't, we never said, I really didn't catch that. We didn't say, we've never said that God become Abraham. It seemed like maybe you were, I don't know, I didn't really get the point there. But you have said over and over that to a first century Jew, when you said God, when they heard God, they equated that with the Father. Exactly. You're one step closer to the truth. First Timothy 3.16 says God was manifest in the flesh. According to you, that's going to be the Father. But with this text here, there's no need to dance on this text. It's very plain. And oh, by the way, this great revelation that Trinitarians think they have about Father of Eternity, or yeah, Father of Eternity, you can't father eternity. Eternity is without beginning and without end. So, that no wonder no one uh, hardly uh, quotes it like that. Some do, but it's not the. It does not mean that the second person in the Godhead is the uh, a possessor or father of eternity. This is referring to the mighty God, the eternal Father. Uh, that's very plain. We don't have to dance on it to make it say Trinitarianism. Malachi two ten says that to us there is one. Uh, or rather, we, we all have one father, one creator. It's not one creator. Uh, you know the scripture. So you have one father who is, by the way, one creator, which really gives you problems with your Jesus of Ecclesiastes 12, by the way. So we can accept this text just as it's written. We don't have to explain it away to hold on to a free-minded God. We can allow the text to speak for itself, and it just simply identifies Jesus Christ as the mighty God, as the eternal Father, I won't get into, if you're taking notes, y'all look at uh, Habakkuk 3.6, 1 Chronicles 29.2, where that they translate as everlasting mountains or mountains of eternity, marble stones, stones of marble. This is just how you say the same phrase of eternal Father in Hebrew. So th there's really no, there's not really much for me to refute there. The text just speaks for itself. All right, Sam, you get an opportunity to respond. Yeah, and I mean this. I really like Mr. Perkins because I like his personality, so there's nothing personal. I hope we can talk more in the future. I enjoy you immensely because you're passionate. But I do have to say, please stop attacking the straw man. Can you please do that? Do me a favor. I'm trying to accurately represent you. Try to do that with me because you just attacked Starman. You said 
uh, fathering eternity it makes no sense. That's not what I said the term means. <clears throat> Father of eternity, if you look at it, and you know you can't deny it, that's why I asked you to define Abigail for us. What does Abigail mean? Father eternity simply means possessor of. Yes, you can possess everlastingness because if you see how odd is used in Isaiah, it refers to God living forever. So if you take father eternity, it means the possessor of everlasting life, the source of life. And that's exactly what the New Testament says. Jesus, the son, the word is in him was life and that life was the light of men. I am the way and the truth and the life, John 14, 16. John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life, John 5, 21. Just as the Father gives life and raises the dead, so too the Son gives life to, life to whom he wants. That's all it means. It doesn't make him the person that you call the Father. And you kept saying, I believe in a three-minded Godhead. Well, my friend, either you're going to have to believe that or you got a schizophrenic God at your hand because in Romans 8, 26, 27, Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. God, who searches hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Please don't tell me the Spirit is simply the Father in a different manifestation. Because, again, either God is a terrible communicator or a deceiver because it says God knows the mind of the Spirit. But if the Spirit is simply the Father in a different form, that means what Paul is saying is that God knows his own mind. And then God knows his own will. You're making gobbly gook of the Scriptures because the plain reading, God is different from the Spirit. The Spirit has a mind distinct from God. God knows what the mind of the Spirit is as the Spirit knows what the will of God is. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. This does not comport with your view unless you have a schizophrenic God or a God who's play acting, pretending that he is not the spirit, which is why the spirit has a mind that he can know, when in reality the spirit is him in a different mode. I won't use that term manifestation. So it's basically God saying, I know my own mind and I know my own will. Why don't you just come out and say that, God? Why do you give the impression that the spirit is not you, you're not the spirit, and he has a mind distinct from you? All because the God you preach is not the God of the Bible. It's a God I believe in, the triune God. But go ahead. All right, Mr. Perkins, you get the last word here. Okay, A, um, he charges us with, or charges me rather, with making gobbly group uh, out of the scriptures. And yet, this is the same person who can look at a single person pronoun and somehow force feed three divine minds into that, and we're making gobbly goop. If that's not gobbly goop, I would love to see the definition of gobbly goop. Secondly, the scriptures say over and over and over that God has one mind. Uh, and this is always going to be the flaw of Trinitarianism right here, is that you have more than one God, or rather, well, you have that too, but you have more than one mind in God. Numbers 23, 19, one mind. Jeremiah 19, 5. Jeremiah 32, 5, or 32, 35. One mind in conjunction with single person pronouns. So the godly group is coming from the Trinitarianism, not from the people that can allow the text to speak for itself. First Samuel 15, 29 of the CSB says, furthermore, the eternal one of Israel does not lie or change his single person pronoun mind. Oh, but God, wait a second. You're really three minds. Didn't you know that? And you're really three eternal ones. Didn't you know that God? No. Because Mr. Shamoon and all of the Trinitarians has a false God. It's false doctrine. You will find it nowhere in the word of God. And I'm very thankful to God that he led me out of that. Now, your thing about stop attacking straw man, right back at you. You say that I'm saying that the Father become flesh and that in my mind, God equals Father. Wrong. In my mind, God equals whoever he has to be. Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus. Uh, the Father, you're assuming that we only see a Father as God. Uh, and, and, and yet, there is some truth to that because we believe there's one God, but we don't run around saying that, as I've heard you say, Jesus sent Jesus. Jesus is praying to himself. We don't run around making those assertions. And, and your, your comment about have to believe in three minds in God to be, what, I don't remember what you said, uh, therefore, I think, or schizophrenic. Um, and you said also that God is a terrible communicator if he's one person. Really? Hmm, I thought I read where he did things all alone, all by himself. 
terrible communication, God. You, didn't you know there's really three of you there? I mean, I know that Moses spoke to you face to face, but God, there's really three of you uh, uh, behind the scenes that, that is functioning and operating. So the deal about him being a terrible communicator, good grief, that, that's like Hitler calling somebody else a murderer. For, <laughs> for the Trinitarian to call someone else uh, uh, making eisegesis and making godly goop out of the scriptures, Trinitarianism is the definition of that. And so uh, there's a lot more I could say here, but I'll just hand that over to you. I didn't take any more notes right there. So I'll hand it back over to you. All right. So that's actually it for Isaiah 9, 6. So we have one more scripture. We have one more scripture, and then we will take a few minutes for you all to, you know, uh, ask each other some questions, you know, and, you know, maybe about 10 minutes at a time or something like that so last but not least we will go to the gospel of john we will be in chapter 10 and we will be at verses 29 and 30 sam you will have to first go at this and this is the last scripture that we will go over on today john chapter 10 verses 29 and 30 says my father who has given them to me this again is jesus talking my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand i and the father are one sam if you can exegete that and tell us what this is saying go ahead yeah it's important we begin at 27 jesus says my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me i give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand i give them eternal life they will never perish no one can snatch them out of my hand my sheep my voice in my hand i give them eternal life my father has given them to me. It's greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Now, he knows the Greek verb, esmen, and means we are. It's not singular. It's plural, hen. We'll get into that a little later because I want to see his response. But I want you to catch what Jesus did, did. And the Jews correctly realized what he was saying. Because at, at this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And he said, many good works I've shown you from the father. For which of these do you stone me? They go, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you are man... Make yourself out to be God. Now, why do they think that? Because the language, my sheep, in my hand, my voice, I give them eternal life, right? No one can pluck them out of my hand. That echoes Deuteronomy 32, 39, and it echoes Psalm 95, <clears throat> 6 to 8, where Yahweh says that he makes alive and none can deliver out of his hand. That's Deuteronomy 32, 39. And then it says that they are the sheep, Israel, Psalm 95, 6 to 8. They are the sheep in his hand, and they are to hear his voice. So they realize he's claiming to be Yahweh in the flesh, which, again, Mr. Perkins doesn't deny. And it's interesting because he said that I'm attacking strongman, but he admit I'm right because he says there is some truth to what you're saying, some truth to that. When I say you believe that the Father became flesh, but we don't say it that way. Of course you don't say it that way because if you say it that way, people say that and see that your position is nonsense. It butchers the scriptures, but I, I'm glad you admit I am not attacking straw man. There is some truth to that. Now, here's my question to Mr. Perkins. I want him to explain if the son is the father in the flesh, he can tap dance all he wants and say it's not the father. Yes, it is because you just said there is some truth to that. That is the father in the flesh. In what way is Jesus saying no one can pluck them out of my hand and my father's hand? And what Jesus claims to do is only what God can do. If Jesus is the Father, it's the same self-hand. It's not two distinct hands because it's the same person, the Father in heaven, and then the Father in human flesh. And then explain to me, please, the use of the plural verb, we are. How does that make sense in your view if God in the flesh equates to the Father in the flesh, which is what you believe, but you don't like to say it because that's what you said. There's some truth to that. But we don't say it that way. Of course you won't say it that way because people will see that your position is unbiblical and nonsensical. But go ahead. Amen. Mr. Perkins, you can now respond. Okay, number one, when I say there's some truth to that, I'm simply saying that, that yes, we, there is a sense in which Jesus is the Father, and there's a sense in which he isn't. We do not say his humanity is the Father. We say that, as the Bible says, as Jesus said, the Father that dwells in me, he does the work. But he's not just a man. He is also God in the flesh. Um, now, regarding your your claim, oh, yeah, okay, so you say you don't say it that way because it'll, it'll demonstrate that we're supposedly in false doctrine. And yet, you run around saying there's three minds in God, 
Uh, in fact, you even argue for bodily separation in God. I've seen you do it. And yet, <laughs> you're telling us that we've got the false doctrine? Uh, and, and you just did it again, in fact. You said the two hands. You refer to two hands. What you don't see and what Trinitarians don't see is that, and I'm not being ugly, it, this is conceptual tritheism. It's not confessional tritheism, but when you consistently use terms like separate minds, separate bodies, separate hands, etc., pray tell me how does that make sense? We agree with the plural, uh, the plural term, we. That's not a problem. The context identifies who that was. You've said yourself over and over that to a first century Jew, when they heard the term father, or rather God, I'm sorry, that that denoted the father. Exactly. Thank you. And so in, 10, in verse 33 that you quoted, whenever he says that, uh, or rather scripture says they picked up stones to stone him, because you being a man are making yourself God, whom you have said over and over, uh, when a Jew says that in first century, that's denoting the father. Amen. So whenever they hear the term theos, or rather pater, here, they say that's father. Wait, I am a father one. Yeah, they say that that is father. I'm sorry, when they hear the term God. I'm sorry, I got it backwards. They see that as the father. Exactly. That is exactly our position. There is an ontological distinction between the father and the son. I don't know how many times I've got to say that. But we agree with all of that that you're quoting. What we don't agree with now and never will is that there's three separate bodies in God, three separate minds in God. And I, I hope you try to deny that because it's going back for our own. You can get embarrassed real quick because you have said over and over that that there's separate separations. So I'll just wait to see what you do with that. By the way, how much time do I have left? Uh, you got to wrap up your thought, actually. <sighs> okay. Um. I wanted to discuss the masculine singular. Hey, Jesus uses the neuter hand, but I'll get into that in my next uh, speech. All right, Sam, feel free to respond. Yeah, again, it's a sad that he keeps strawmanning me. He keeps saying that I said to a first century Jew, the term God would refer to the Father in heaven. I said that in the context of Jesus not coming out and claiming to be God in an unqualified sense because he's not the Father. That actually, that argument is made to show he's not the Father. So why would you strawman? And attack <clears throat> what I said when in context what I was trying to say is to a first century Jew the term God first century Jew the term God unqualified sense means the father in heaven so Jesus in order to avoid that confusion doesn't say I'm God he claims to be the son of God in such a way that they realize he's not the father but equal to the father in essence that's why they didn't accuse him of being the father but a man making himself out to be God because they could see in the plain language he just said I'm not the father I'm distinct from the Father. And again, you agree and confirm my point, though you're trying desperately to avoid <clears throat> the implication. You again said, yes, Jesus is the Father in some sense. Exactly. And then you say they're ontologically different. How so, Mr. Perkins, in your view, if God became flesh, that's the Father's flesh. So yes, there's an ontological distinction in that flesh is not divine, but it's the flesh of the Father. That's the father became flesh, but you don't want to say it that way because you understand the problems it will create for you. And about the three minds, if you again take what I say in context, I'm using the term mind to denote they're distinct persons in intimate fellowship, which you do not accept, which means you are stuck with Romans 8, 26, 27, which you did not adequately address. How can God know the mind of the spirit and the spirit know what the will of God is? I want you to come out and tell us, is the spirit, the father in a different role? Whatever term you want to use, you don't want to use the term mode because that's still the father. So why is Paul saying the father knows the mind of the spirit if that's the mind of the father? Because remember, it's one mind to you. So is Paul saying God knows his own mind and knows his own will? Then why, Paul, are you saying God who knows the hearts, knows the mind of the spirit, and the spirit knows the will of God because that's either ignorance or deception because the language is plain as day the spirit is different from god with a distinct mind that god knows and god has a will that the spirit knows and perfectly submits to but in your view this is simply the father knowing his own mind knowing his own will that's why your position is gobbledygook and you can't answer and do address not haste which is used in first timothy 2 5 because that's referring to the father distinct from the son but hen 
an esmen in John 10.30 because you claim to know Greek. Go ahead. All right, Mr. Perkins. Go ahead and respond. Yeah, gladly. I'm glad that you brought up a uh, uh, hen, actually. Let me just read you the NET second edition. The phrase hen esmen is a significant assertion with Trinitarian implications. Hen is neuter, not masculine. So the assertion is not that Jesus and the Father are one person, but one thing. Now, I would say right at the outset, God's not a thing, but regardless. He says here that if the masculine was used, then, folks, we would have one person. But his argument is that it's not used here, and so hence we don't have one person. I've got pillar commentary by Carson right here who says the same thing. Well, guess what? Goodbye to the false doctrine of Trinitarianism. Because when you go to Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 29, guess what word it uses, Mr. Mr. Shamoon and anyone else listening? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is masculine, singular, haste. Which I, I want you to show us somewhere where that this is uh, refers to more than one person. And I hope you go to Galatians 3.28 and 1 Corinthians 8.6 and even 1 Timothy 2.5. We'll have fun with that. But you said that uh, I'm attacking a straw man. Mr. Shamoon, uh, as, as a supposed apologist, you should know to watch your words more carefully. Because whatever you say is going to be used. I only use your words, period. So if you don't like the words that I use, you probably need to change some of your some of your methodologies because I only quoted you regarding, and I don't know why we're discussing Romans 8. I thought we were discussing John 10, but I'll gladly go there. Whenever you say that the Spirit, I'd have to look at it again, but the Spirit intercedes, no, for who? For us. He is interceding for us. And so... You are saying, and by the way, why doesn't he inter intercede outside of us? Because the, spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit is God in spiritual activity. No, we're not saying he's an uh, impersonal force, as JWs do. You make that claim a lot, too. We don't believe that. So, so this is, again, you have three separate minds in God, according to your Trinitarianism. And, and you're right with John chapter 10, by the way. They picked up stones to stone him because he was claiming Father equals God. In forensics proper, there is no greater testimony than the ones that are on the site. Eyewitness testimony. Well, guess what they say, Mr. Shamoon? They say you, being God, are, or rather a man, are making yourself God. God equals Father to them. They equated that together. If he was just saying that they're in unity, they wouldn't have picked up stones to stone him. Every rabbi claims to be, well, not every, but most rabbis claim to be in unity with God. That wouldn't be a big deal. That's not what they objected to. They objected to Jesus' assertion that he is, is, is the Father himself, God in the flesh himself. You have man and God. And we, again, we believe that. So you can quote all those scriptures all you want, um, and you continue to say that we're in false doctrine, yet you worship a three-minded God that no one even knows exists. You're the one in false doctrine, and you need to repent before you leave this earth, and I hope you do. All right, my man Sam, you have an opportunity to get the last word on this, and then we will be done with the scriptures. I'm going to challenge him when we interact to answer the question. I challenge him to quote one rabbi who says, I give believers eternal life. <clears throat> they will never perish, and no one can pluck them out of my hand. I will challenge you to quote a rabbi that says, he is one with God in that sense of giving eternal life and that he preserves believers and no one can pluck them out of his hand. The reason why the Jews got upset wasn't simply that Jesus said he was one with the Father, but one in his ability to do what only the Father can do, even though he's not the Father. So you just distorted the text in my presence. You still were not able to address hen esmin. Why there hen is neuter and esmin is plural because you have no response because either Jesus is a distinct divine person who became flesh, one with the Father, which is why he can do what the Father does, and the Father does what only God can do, and the Jews realize you're not claiming to be the Father, because you said he is your Father, you're one with him, but you're claiming to be the Son that can do what only God does, though you're not the Father. So you had to distort the text, and you had to then distort what rabbis say, so I'm going to call you on on it. Make sure you got a quote from a rabbi who says, I'm one with Yahweh in his ability to give eternal life and preserve believers. You won't find it. It's not there. Then you challenge me to show you where haste, 
masculine. And what's uh, here, here's what's funny. You quoted a source that says that Hen Esmond has Trinitarian implications, that they're one thing. And you said God isn't a thing. This again shows either you don't know language or you're trying to be a little. I don't want to attack you. But anyway, because the Bible does use neuter nouns and pronouns pronouns for God, the Father and Jesus Christ, where John 4, 22, he says to the Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. We Jews worship what we know, what we know. That's a neuter pronoun referring to the Father. And 1 John 1, verses 1 to 3, there John uses neuter pronouns to describe the word of life, the eternal life, the life with the Father that was made manifest. So again, you are distorting what Trinitarians mean by thing. They're not saying impersonal. They do believe God is tri-personal, but by thing they're saying that it means that they're one something, not one person. And you have to distort them like you're distorting what I'm arguing for. Now, if I have enough time, it's ironic you went to Mark 12, 28 to 37, because if you just continue to 35 to 37, Jesus defines that one Lord of Israel as God and Messiah together, not a singular person, but two distinct persons that are united in their essence. So why is he using masculine haste? Simply to denote in this context that the Lord God of Israel is one, but not one person. Because he goes on to identify another distinct from the Lord God, who happens to be the Lord of David, and, one with the Lord God, and that's the Messiah. And he even mentions a spirit there. And you still didn't under address Romans 8. If the spirit has a mind that God knows, is that God knowing his own mind? You were not able to address that. Because your position is not biblical, the Trinity is. Awesome. All right, gentlemen. Well, I wanna. I, I'm gonna imagine that everyone listening and watching is clapping right along with me. So. Are they listening? Yeah, uh, not right now, not not right now. <laughs> but when they will be, they'll be hearing me clap for the first time. So, so I'm clapping. Look, man, thank y'all so much for y'all time. So, um, I appreciate y'all going through those six scriptures and parking there prayerfully. You know, people will be able to listen to this and have this conversation assist them with their studies. Of course, none of us should be going with whoever we think sounds the best or has the most charisma or whatever in this particular dialogue is the final authority the word of god is the final authority this is to assist people in their studies um so before uh before we all you know part ways you know let's spend a little bit of time kind of directly uh interchanging if y'all if y'all have about i just want to ask uh sir perkins uh just curious who you debated trinitarians because i haven't watched your debates just curiously who have you debated I can't hear oh, you. My fault. My fault. There you go. He can hear you now, Roger. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, tons of Matt Slick, uh, mm -hmm. James White, uh, man, uh, Edward Dalcourt informally. Um, we, we've never debated formally. Um, who else? Uh, Bruce Reeves, Glenn Burt, just numerous, uh, numerous men. Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> uh, actually, his wife years ago on the radio. Um, so so yeah that now let me just say guys and, and i don't have a lot of time i just want to say thank you for even willing to consider to dialogue with me i consider that an honor in light of all the people you've debated and i really enjoy you i like your personality you're hot i'm suspecting you're a syrian no i'm just kidding <laughs> no i'm not serious <clears throat> no and, and same thing you know i uh I, I was thinking earlier today you know like edward dalcourt i actually like it I mean, he has a very likable demeanor and so forth. So it's nothing personal. Uh, right. We just, to be honest, we just both think the other one's lost, period. Yep. I have to be honest, and so do you. Um, my wife is sick. I'm not trying to get out of this, though. I'm just saying I don't have a whole lot of time right here. Um, so we can, I guess, address a few things for just a few minutes at, at the very most. Um, I, won't, I won't address the John 4 thing. Um, I don't want to go back to that. Um, I don't really have a major question and the only thing i want to throw out your way is that you did appeal to the holy spirit as a person i know we haven't uh discussed that a lot but i thought you just said if i understood correctly referring to the holy spirit as a person i, I would i would advise you guys if you can get daniel wallace's uh bulletin for biblical research i've got his paper right here um it's unbelievable 29 pages of exegesis as you know he's he's the man one of them at least in in greek and his conclusion is that we cannot prove that the Holy Spirit 
is a person out of the Word of God. You want me to read you the, the exact so you don't think no, that I'm... He can claim mis- whatever he wants. Sure, that's fine. Okay, well, he says... Go ahead. But you do go believe. Ahead. Here's what's ironic. I don't know why you're quoting him because you do believe, even though he's not a distinct person, you do believe the Holy Spirit is a person, right? Well, I believe that, that the Holy Spirit is... He's certainly not an impersonal force, So, but I would not say... I'm sorry. What is he, though? What is he? He's a spirit. I, I allow the text speak for itself. He is God's Holy Spirit. God over and over refers to himself as his spirit. So I, I, we see this as the text says it. It's God's Holy Spirit. It's not a third person with a separate mind. I'm not being ugly. I'm just saying no, that's true. How do you, then is the Father a person? The Father is personal. Um, so I would say that the Father and and the Spirit uh, are a spirit person. I would say that the Son is God in the flesh. So there's ontological distinctions there, and I know where you're going. So no, you know, I'm just, I want you to see if you because what Daniel Wallace says, person, he means that he can speak and be spoken to, has a will, has emotions. So let's use the term personal because that's how you describe Father. Do you believe the Spirit is personal? Yes. Okay, so then you disagree with Daniel Wallace. Good. I, I don't. Uh, no, no. See, you're doing it again. You're distorting no. what I just said. I, I just said. Would you like me to quote it, Mr. Shamoon? So well, you stop attacking you the show. Did, no, no. I didn't attack Strongman. Let me repeat what you said. Daniel Wallace said that you cannot prove conclusively from the New Testament that the Spirit is a person. We define person from Daniel Wallace's perspective because he's a Trinitarian like me. When we use the term person, we don't mean a flesh and bo- blood embodied. No, I know. Entity. Okay. Someone with emotions, intellect, and will can speak and be spoken to. Do you believe the Spirit can speak? Yes, because He is God. Okay, but so He's can, not the third person of the God. I'm not, not, not so. arguing that. Let's put that aside. So He can speak. Can He be spoken to? The Holy Spirit. We can pray and He hears. He hears us. So I don't run around saying, he will. Okay, okay, okay. See, so here we go. Here's this is what you do every time you talk over people and you don't let us talk. If you're going to do that, I'm out. So. So, so, okay, then you let me answer you or I'll be gone real quick. So, the thing is, the Holy Spirit, as in Colossians 2, 9, in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the divinity bodily. Um, and then I meant, to, I meant to quote Colossians 2, 10, and you are complete in him, not them, him. So, to answer your question, uh, the, the Spirit is, is God in spiritual activity. Everywhere you see the Holy Spirit mentioned in the Bible there's an activity. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in other tongues. Um, Samson, the jawbone of a donkey, the spirit move, etc. We go on and on. So we view him as, as God in spiritual activity. That's our view of who the Holy Spirit is. All right. So then when it says God knows the mind of the Spirit, whose mind does God know? Romans 8, 27. Well, first place, he's interceding for us. You, you, you keep not quoting that part. That's strong. He, he, it's no, no, it's not. It's the Bible. So the Bible's irrelevant? This is your text, sir. Now you're attacking Strawman again. Now you're talking over me and attacking Strawman. So if you want, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Don't attack Strawman. I didn't ignore it. I know it says he intercedes for us according to God's will, which was part of my argument. So now deal with what I just said. It says there that the one who searches hearts knows the mind of the Spirit as the Spirit intercedes for us in accord to God's will. Whose mind does God, God know? That's in the text. Again... He is the text is he's interceding for believers. You're not addressing that. So this is not three separate minds. Again, I'll ask you, why doesn't he do it outside of outside of believers? And regarding your thing about can I answer? Regarding your thing about uh, not attacking straw man and, and, and true doing unto others as you would have them do to you, I challenge anybody right now that's listening, and Mr. Veda, I hope you don't edit this out. Go to Mr. Shamoon's uh, uh, his uh, website. Go to his website, and you'll hear him calling people dogs. You'll hear him calling people sons of uh, Satan. So you need to take your own advice. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, I, I, I will say uh, I want y'all to uh, – I have it timed out for about uh, 12 minutes for y'all to keep doing what y'all doing. Yeah, yeah. But if we can, mm-hmm. let's keep yes. focus on the Bible or the specific questions exactly. that but relate okay, to this want... topic. Vader, I don't care. He yeah, I was just addressing what he said. I mean, he, no, no, he's no, the no. one who said that about. I didn't, you, 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 like you do, it's your habit. You take things out of context. I didn't say <laughs> I have a problem with you attacking me personally if I deserve it. If you are a blasphemous swine, I'll call you that. But put that aside. I'm telling you, which you still did not answer. You still. I don't know if you, you realize you're not answering my question. Let me try this again. Because the, uh, the not for me, forgive me, for the audience. 
Whose mind does God know? It says he knows the mind of the spirit. Whose mind is it if the, if the spirit is God in spiritual activity? Is Paul saying God knows his own mind? You didn't address that. I don't know if you realize you're not addressing that. For the sake of the audience, and, forget you. And address it so they can understand what your position is. Well, A, you, you say that all the time. And Trinitarians say, well, you're not addressing me. You're not answering the question. We're giving you the answer, but you don't like it. If you're wanting me to say there's three minds in God, absolutely not. That's absurd. So, again, he's interceding for believers why is he not interceding mr shamoon outside of believers that's problematic for you and so you know you're you why you're saying right? that well you can let me finish you're saying that i'm not answering you you didn't answer the masculine singular of just one person you didn't ask answer all the nine thousand single person pronouns that i asked you i'm still asking you how do you have three divine minds and a single person pronoun yeah, you really We'll let the people judge if I've answered or not because you yeah. made another mistake and I'm going to turn this against you because you quoted passage in the Old Testament where God has one mind, one mind. It did not enter my mind and it's singular, right? I want you to explain this for me because I want people to understand your position. I'm trying to help you out because honestly, if someone hears you, they don't know what you believe because you're all over the place. So, second, well, okay, but Second Chronicles 30 verse 20, I want you to recall what you said. You quoted verses where God says it did not enter my mind, mine is singular. Okay. I want you to address this for me. Second Chronicles 30, verse 12. The hand of God was also on Judah. Second Chronicles, Chronicles 30, verse 12, 12. To give them one heart. To do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. How can multiple beings with multiple hearts be said to have one heart using your hermeneutic? Because remember what you said. If God says, nothing entered my mind, singular, it's one person. Are you saying all these beings are one person, one being? Hey, earlier, I was listening to you. Somebody sent me a link of you, and you, uh, I think it was a debate you did last year, and they were grilling you on three minds. I can't remember the name of it. And when they kept getting in there, you, you told them, you said, well, we can't say of, of, of God what we can say of persons. His thoughts are higher than ours, et cetera, et cetera. But now, whenever you think it supports your Trinity doctrine, just got to have your three minds in God, now all of a sudden, oh, well, now we can't apply that to there. So if you are using human beings as a representation of your Trinity, which you do all the time, you are not a monotheist, and you need to repent of your heresy. Okay, but friend, can, I don't know if you understand what I'm doing, and maybe it's my fault. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Let me show you what you said. So you understand that you keep falsely accusing me that's fine the, the the audience will decide who's addressing what you made the claim that because the word mind is singular in reference to god see i'm addressing that i didn't say god is a man i didn't say that i know god transcends humanity but your argument presupposes that god can only have one mind if he's one god where are you getting that from because if you have more than it's one mind, the bible no no you don't because i just showed you God uses the language of one heart for multiple peoples. Does that mean they're one person? That you didn't address. Oh, no, no, I did address it. I showed you the inconsistency of your own view. Maybe we'll try this again. Apparently, I speak fast or something. I don't know. But you tell people, tell people all the time, we cannot say of man what we say of God. But now... Yeah, you're trying to do it. You always quote Isaiah, his, his ways are higher now, etc. I can send you the link, sir. Yeah, so, but now you're trying to do that. Where do I get that God's one mind? It's called what he said. It's called what comes from his own lips. <laughs> do you mean the same God who says multiple beings with multiple hearts have one heart? See, God said it. So they're one heart, one person. You still don't get the point. Let me no, I get the point. Let me address you. Let me finish the point. As a Trinitarian, and I've been saying this like a broken record, we expect that God will speak of himself in the singular mind because he is one in one sense. But at the same time, we're not surprised to find in the revelation, you have the spirit that has a mind that God knows. You have the father that has a mind and thoughts that the spirit knows. And because why the one God is more than one person. And how does the Bible convey that? By speaking of distinctions among them, when it's speaking of how they relate to one another, but in reference to their essence being one, we expect that the Bible will use singular. One God, one mind, one. We expect that. But for your position to be true, why then do we find plural verbs, participles, 
<clears throat> pronouns used of God in the Old Testament. And why do we find the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us in accord with the will of God? God knows the mind of the Spirit. How can God know the mind of the Spirit if the Spirit is God in spiritual activity? Is Paul saying God knows his own mind? You never address these things, and I've been addressing you. Yeah, no, you have not been addressing me. And yes, I did address your, your arguments. Again, you're saying, if I go by what you're saying, then we have God knowing the mind of God. You also teach bodily separation in Daniel chapter 7. I've heard you do it. So, and John too. So what I'm saying is, I'll say it again, that, that he is interceding for the believers. He's not, this is not one God investigating the mind of another God. It's absurd. Okay, and and me, Paul... Well, let me say this. Paul in Galatians 4, 6 says that he sends the spirit of his son crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6. I've also heard your stuff on 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 17. And perhaps we can discuss that at some point. I would love to discuss that with you. So uh, to answer your question, if you're wanting me to say that the Bible teaches three separate minds, as you have said, in three separate bodies, it will never be because God says the opposite using masculine, singular, uh, par participles, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know what else to tell you. Okay, let me let me address your straw manning me again, but the, the God different <laughs> bodies. Well, let me let me address it, sir. Can you explain to me when Jesus came out of the water of baptism? Did not the Spirit descend in a bodily shape like a dove? Was that two bodies there? Are you? Uh, let me. I just, I'm not trying to set you up here, but I'm trying. Are you su suggesting? That there are three bodies in God? Is no, that no. what you're saying? Address the question. No. Three, Luke 3.22, if in case you didn't know that passage, it says the spirit, I, I will descended, know. the spirit descended in bodily shape like a dove. Was the spirit there in bodily shape? Yes, but but if you're saying that... I mean, hold on. Okay. Okay. You're not going to cut over me, okay? You do this to everybody else. You're not going to do it to Rod's purpose. So number, number two is, is that if you're saying, and it sounds like you're saying this, that there's bodily separation in God. You've got the human Messiah, who is God the Son, according to you. You've got God the Holy Spirit. And then you've got, you, sir, you have spatial separation in God. And if that's the case, you need to go join up with your Mormon friends. Because that's what the Mormons believe. Now, Vader, you're noticing he accuses me of talking over him, but he talks over me and doesn't answer my question. But I'll let you get away with it because I don't want you to use excuses. Because I've aged you over and over. Okay, no, no, let's try this a third time. Yes, I And am. maybe we'll end after this because you're not answering anything. Is it true? <laughs> I mean, Luke, 3, it. Luke 3 22. Let's try. Let's see. I want to give you a final shot. Luke 3 22. Is it not true Jesus in a human body comes out and the Holy Spirit descends in bodily shape as a dove? So the Spirit appears in physical form as a dove. Is that not two bodies? Yes or no? Do you agree with the text? That is, I'm not going to say that's two bodies like you're saying. You're saying that's two bodies. If you're asking me if I think that the dove represents the Holy Spirit, then sure, of course. But that does, that does not demand three separate minds in God. And by the way, you appeal to the Jews all the time. So let's see if you'll go here. Yeah. Who, please show me who on the banks of Jordan said, wow, now we've got a trinity. We've been wrong all these years, but now we've got a trinity. You can't show it because it doesn't exist other than in your Trinitarian doctrine. All right. Can you show me where it says, wow, we got one person in the Godhead. So that got one God means one person. He's only one person. Show me them using that language. Oh, oh how many times do you want? We can go to Galatians 3.20. God person. is one person. No, it yes. Say one person. yes, it does. Okay. Do, do you know what the masculine singular means? Do you know what the masculine singular means? Oh, I'll be glad to. Oh, it's uh, Theos hates Esten, I think it is. Okay, now, Theos hates Esten, and then finish the verse. Read Galatians 3, 19 and 20, finish it for me. I understand the mediator, etc., etc. So, no, I'm not going to chase your rabbit trails. I just need you to answer my question, sir. Let's come back to my point again, which you again tried to Oh, make. yeah, so, of course. Uh, of course we will. Got to get off of Galatians, don't we? Anyway, listen, since uh, we're not, you're not answering questions, are you sure this is productive we continue? Because I'm still waiting for you to tell me, was the Holy Spirit, because you said... That three separate minds. That wasn't my question. Luke three twenty two. I don't know how many times I'm gonna repeat it. Luke three twenty two. I gotta answer it. <laughs> you haven't. Holy Spirit descended have. in bodily shape as a dove. It doesn't say the dove symbolizes the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit came down in bodily shape as a dove. The dove was the Holy Spirit appearing in bodily shape. How many bodies was that? As a dove, sir. You. What did you just say? You just how said that it doesn't say. Oh, 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 okay, hold on. You, you said it didn't say that the Holy Spirit represents. No, that, yeah, does, no, that, that, no, you said that the dove does not. It didn't say the dove represents, uh, represents the Holy Spirit. 
Right, right. But I'm right. trying to answer you, sir. I know about that. Uh, but but you're arguing bodily separation in God, and that is tritheism. Always will be, no matter what you what say. What's that bodily shape of the dove separate from the human body of Jesus? Just real quickly. Okay. Was it separate? Okay. I, I, I would be glad to ask you. I, hold on. Are you saying that there are separate bodies in God? No. Is that what you're arguing? No, because you're attacking straw man. But are you, you know, this is what you just said. Are this is what you just said. Up, Praise the Lord. Later. All right. So thank you all so much. You know, um, I do pray that the listeners and the viewers, you know, are, are able to be blessed and have this dialogue assisting. <laughs> You know, assist in uh, the studies, you know, as it relates to this topic of oneness theology, uh, Trinitarian teaching, you know, is God one God who operates in three distinct co-equal co-eternal persons or is God one God with three different manifestations? Uh, Roger Perkins, did I misrepresent you when I framed it that way? Was that fine? No, yeah, I didn't really hear it all. But what we believe is three simultaneous manifestations of God. But not just three. We don't just limit it three. Okay, so Are we going to get closing can, statements or not? Um, yeah. Can can you can can you uh, unpack that a little bit? What you just said. You say you don't limit it at three. Why don't can you, you unpack do this? that yeah. a little bit? Why don't you give him his close? You can finish up. So how many minutes do we have? I can't. Um, I can't the, the, the the closing the closing is going to be like three minutes. Okay, then let him just wrap it up in three minutes and explain. Okay. Um, yeah, that's because Mr. Shmoon wants to get the last word. So what I want to say is in apostolicacademics.com, that is my website, Mr. Shamoon has a habit of after he debates people, he goes and writes against them and attacks them. So I'm just telling the audience I'll be responding to whatever he puts out on apostolicacademics.com. That's my first thing. Is this the closing, uh, Veda? Is this the closing? Uh yeah, that, that is the closing, but if you wanted to unpack uh, that question, I wouldn't count that in, on, on your time if you wanted to unpack Oh, it. yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is we don't limit uh, a God. We don't limit him to to merely, I don't want to use the term merely, but we don't just say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You have scriptures that talk about the Son of Man. You have scriptures that talk about the seven spirits of God. We simply say that God can simultaneously do whatever needs to be done, uh, be it Old Testament or, or New Testament. But and actually, it's called uh, theologians call this uh, right the other day, poly. Let's see, uh, Christological polymorphism. Um, they're getting this from the ancient of the days and the interaction with the Son of Man. There's actually some texts that actually identify, early texts too, identify the Ancient of Days as the Son of Man. So what we're saying is, Jesus can do it all. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. So that's my point. Awesome. You can go ahead with your closing statement now. You got three minutes. Okay. Uh, oh, wow. Let me get to it. So closing statement. Okay. Well, we've heard tonight that um, we've heard over and over. He has no problem saying that there are three separate bodies in God, that there's three separate minds in God. He gets mad when I tell him that, no, there's not, and I'm not going to tell him there's three minds in God, never will. No scripture for that, none whatsoever. Um, Mr. Shamoon has said over and over, God the Father's individual with his own shape, his own mind. God the Son, his own shape, his own mind. God the Holy Spirit, his own shape, his own mind. And yet he still wants us to believe that Trinitarianism is monotheism. Um, I wish I had time to address his uh, uh, John 840. I don't. But the closing statement, I would submit to you that in really, there is no such thing as Trinitarianism. There, in fact, Trinitarians are actually, I've made this argument many times, quadratarians. They have the divine God, the Father, divine God, the Son, divine God, the Holy Spirit. But then they have the problem of the human God, the Son. So they have two sons. He's told us tonight that they, that they basically have two fathers, but they mean it in a different way with his interpretation of Isaiah 9 and 6. And so we would all agree that this is a heaven or hell issue. Um, in the Bible, the, the most important commandment of all is the hero of Israel, the Lord our God is one. Haste, and then you go on to read in Mark 12 that he uses single person pronouns to, to describe that one God. Um, in our opinion, Trinitarianism denigrates Jesus Christ, from his position as the one true God to where he shares his divinity in separate bodies, separate minds, completely revised the rules of grammar, turns it on its head, 
now a son, it really doesn't mean he had a birth point, but that he was eternal. Name doesn't really mean name in Acts 2.38, it means the authority. Personal pronouns, singular, don't really mean one person, they mean three persons. So we would just hope and pray, and by God's grace, I've been used, and I, and I mean this, I give glory to God, been used to, to lead many people over the years to, into our Trinitarianism, into biblical monotheism and biblical Christianity. We're here for you. We want to answer any questions that you have. And I will say I do appreciate the interaction uh, tonight. I came prepared. I know he's aggressive, and I'm a, I'm a little aggressive myself. So, But um, I, I do appreciate the interaction, and I've enjoyed my time with you. Mr. Veda Hedgeman. Take care. Hey, amen. I appreciate that, brother. Now, Sam, if you can give us a closing statement, and then I'll close this out. All right. Praise the triumph God. Praise the Father, Holy Spirit. Uh, notice the ad hominem and slander at the end. He says that I go around and I write <clears throat> responses to my debate opponents after debate is finished. I want you to go to answeringblog.wordpress.com and expose that lie for yourself. In point of fact, it was a fellow oneness pastor the late stephen ritchie who actually did a five-part response after he fared so badly in our two debates and i never responded because i let the debate speak for themselves and glory to god today this debate will speak for itself because mr perkins tried to pass himself as a scholar or someone knowledgeable about the languages <laughs> and the languages backfired against them he kept harping on singular <clears throat> pronouns and verbs masculine singular pronouns and verbs but then when i turned it against him and i showed him that masculine singular pronouns verbs participles are used for nations that are not one person he had no response he discombobulated and saying now i'm trying to liken god to creation which means i'm being inconsistent no it means that you can't adjust my arguments it was too much for you because your doctrine is unbiblical it's not of god it's a false doctrine erected by the enemy to mislead people from the true god and then when I showed him that the one true God employs, or that <clears throat> the Hebrew scriptures employ plural verbs, participles, pronouns for the one true God, didn't have any answer. He tried to brush them aside. And then again, he attacks straw man and falsely represents what I believe. He says that I say the father has his own shape. Folks, go listen to me, unlike him who claims to have listened to me. I have taught that the one God is immaterial, <clears throat> incorporeal, spaceless by nature what i have said is because there are three distinct persons each person can manifest in a form and a shape but the father does not have a shape by nature the spirit does not have a shape by nature the son only has physical shape because he became a human being that's why he got discombobulated gobbledygook again when i said how many bodies appeared at jesus's baptism don't forget that because he could not squirm his way out of it glory to the triune god jesus comes out in his human body and the spirit comes down in bodily shape wow mr perkins last time i checked that's two bodies and yet you have no answer because the scripture is your enemy not your friend and on top of that i kept telling him whose mind does god know because remember what he said the spirit is god in spiritual activity that means according to him the spirit is the father in his spiritual activity but then that means paul is either a deceiver or was deceived and a terrible communicator because the plain language is god knows the mind of the spirit and the spirit knows the will of god they're not the same person god the father here is distinct from the spirit which is why he can know the mind of the spirit because the spirit is a person like the father is a person and inseparable glory to the triune god oneness is the doctrine of the devil the trinity is biblical praise the triune god all right so again i want to thank both of you gentlemen for taking the time you know to participate in dialogue and engage each other on is he a real one radio i am very grateful i know both of you guys are busy i know a bunch of people want both of you guys to share your presentations and your positions on several places so i do not take it uh, for granted that you guys were willing to teach and speak and engage on this platform so again as i've said multiple times on this episode you know i pray that this will assist any of you who are listening and or watching in your studies to know who the one true god is for yourself and as we always close i like to say two things now all right you may or may not be reformed but we should all 
be informed. And as we close on Is He a Real One Radio, you already know what we say, y'all. Is he a real one? Yes, he is. And the he that we're talking about is Jesus, y'all. A, A, amen.